Welcome to chapter 19 of Anatomy and Physiology. And in this chapter, we finish off the cardiovascular system by looking at the tissue that your heart and blood vessels are moving around your body. We're going to look at blood. And like usual, before we even start this chapter, you know stuff way back from AMP1. Why? Because we're talking about blood, the tissue. And you've looked at all tissues in, in the body in AMP1. Remember, blood was a type of connective tissue. Remember, like all tissues, it's made up of cells that are surrounded by an extracellular matrix. And you might even remember some of the cells from AMP1. Remember, when you looked at blood, there's really three major groups of cells that we find in blood. And these cells are what we call your formed elements. So when you're looking at blood, you're looking at the formed elements, AKA the cells, plus their liquid environment. And you know, this is anatomy, so we name everything. You know, the cells are called the formed elements and they're kind of floating in a liquid. And that liquid is the extracellular matrix. It's the environment around the cells. We call it plasma. So it turns out when you donate plasma, you're just donating your cells, your blood cells, extracellular matrix. You're donating the, really the liquid environment, your blood cells are kind of floating in. And so in this chapter, we're just going to break down these two major parts to your blood. We're going to break down the liquid environment, the plasma, and see what it's composed of. Remember, we're going to break down the anatomy. And then we'll look at the formed elements. We'll look at the cells in your blood. And we'll also break down their anatomy and talk about some physiology. And again... You might know some of this already from a and P1. When we look at the formed elements, when we look at the cells of your blood, we notice that there are three major groups of cells in the blood. There are red blood cells, sometimes called erythrocytes, white blood cells, sometimes called leukocytes, and platelets. Those are three major groups of cells forming your formed elements. And they're all floating around in that plasma, that liquid environment. And if we were to look at all of your blood up close, turns out we could break it, break it up into different percentages. If you were to get a sample of blood, turns out plasma forms more, a little more than half of, of your blood. The liquid environment is more than half of your blood. While all the cells, or mainly your red blood cells, are forming about 40% of your blood. And a small fraction, less about 1%, we call it the buffy coat, is made up of those other formed elements, your white blood cells and your platelets. I want you to know these, these breakdowns. Plasma is about 50%. Erythrocytes make up about 40%. And your buffy coat, made up of white blood cells and platelets, make up about 1% of your blood. <clears throat> And so we'll be able to look at these th these formed elements up close. Uh, in lab, you'll be going to histologyguide.org to take a look at these things. But you can see them on this picture here on figure 19.1 from your textbook. We're looking at some blood elements up close. When you look at blood under the microscope, you notice the cells right away. You notice the formed formed elements. And when you look at the cells, you notice that one of the cells is making up the majority of what you're seeing. Remember, when you look at blood, up to 40%, about 40% are red blood cells. So when you look at blood under the microscope, the majority of cells you're going to see are red blood cells. And just at a quick glance, they kind of look like pink discs. Sometimes they kind of look like pink donuts. Those are the red blood cells. Those are the erythrocytes. Then keep looking at the picture. You got to look close for this next one. If you notice, there are cells that are smaller than the red blood cell. They look like little dots, little specks kind of scattered around. Those small little dots are the next cell. It's the platelets. And then there's one more group. Again, look back at the picture. You might notice that there are cells that are bigger than the red blood cell. They do not need to look alike but they are all typically bigger than the red blood cell. Those are your white blood cells or your leukocytes. So, and so when you look at blood under the microscope, again, pink discs will be red blood cells, little dots will be platelets, and the bigger cells will be the white blood cells. And where's the plasma? Where's that liquid environment? Where's the extracellular matrix? 
Well, it's all the white space in the background when you look at blood under the microscope. All that white space in the background is plasma. So yeah, I could point to the white space on an exam and ask you to name it. It's the plasma. It's the liquid environment. So before we look at these two major parts of blood up close, before we look at the plasma and the formed elements, like usual, we could talk about what this tissue does overall. And when you think about what this tissue does overall, what blood does overall, it's really linked to what's the function of all the parts of blood. So think of all the things we mentioned inside of blood, like red blood cells. Well, the job of red blood cells basically is to carry oxygen. It carries gases like oxygen and a little bit of carbon dioxide. So because blood cells, red blood cells do it, and they're in blood, we say one major function of blood is to carry and exchange gases. But it's really the red blood cells inside doing it. What else? Uh, what other cells you saw inside of blood? Well, there were the white blood cells, leukocytes. And it turns out the white blood cells typically help to fight infections. When you fight infections, that's an immune function. So we say blood can provide immune functions. It can help to protect you from diseases. Really, it's the white blood cells doing it. What else? Remember in your blood, you also have platelets. Why? Turns out platelets help to keep you from losing blood. How? They clot the blood. To clot blood is to thicken the blood. And they thicken and clot the blood to help close off any breaks in a blood vessel. When you bleed, it's because you've put a little hole in a blood vessel. And platelets will come to thicken the blood in that area to help kind of seal off that break. So we call that blood clotting. That's the job of platelets. So we say that's a function of blood. They could clot the blood. <clears throat> And then there was that liquid environment, the plasma. Turns out you have things dissolved in your plasma, like nutrients or hormones. Remember, you drop hormones directly into the blood. Now you know you're dropping the hormones directly into the liquid environment, the plasma, so that it could send it around the body. So your plasma could transport things dissolved in it. Oh, you remember things that could get dissolved are what we call solutes. So your plasma could transport or distribute solutes around the body. And so because plasma could do it, sorry, we give that function to blood overall. Blood could distribute solutes, but it's really the plasma of blood doing it. And again, blood could do a lot of other things. Again, you might know from AMP1, way back in AMP1, in chapter one, you talked about homeostasis how you maintain that nice, steady internal state. And one thing that you keep in a nice homeostatic range is your temperature. Oh, think about how you thermoregulate. How did you control your temperature? Well, you may or may not remember that your blood has something to do with it. Turns out when you're hot, your blood vessels dilate. And when you're cold, your blood vessels constrict. Why? It's not really something with the blood vessels. It has to deal with the blood. Turns out when blood flows, when it moves, it could carry heat. And so when you're really hot, you're going to dilate your blood vessels so that they could carry the heat and you would lose or radiate the heat to cool down. And when you're cold, you'll constrict the blood vessels so that blood doesn't move that much. So you're not losing that much heat. Your blood could help to maintain your body's temperature. And because your plasma has things dissolved in it, some of those things dissolved in it are buffers. Oh, again, think AMP1. Remember, buffers can neutralize very strong acids and bases, and you have them in your blood. So your blood can help you to control your acid-base levels. Your blood helps to maintain your acid-base homeostasis. And we saw from our heart and blood vessel chapters that how much blood you have, your blood volume, will affect other things, like blood pressure. Remember, the higher the blood volume, the more blood you have to push on blood, ve blood vessels, the higher the pressure will be. So how much blood you have will determine or influence your blood pressure. So your blood, as a function, is to help control or stabilize your blood pressure, simply by controlling how much blood there is.
So when you think about blood, blood is doing a lot of stuff, but it's really just doing, or really just think about what all the parts of blood are doing. And you'll know the basic functions of blood. So from now on, we're going to go through those two major parts, like I mentioned. We're going to go through the plasma, and we're going to go through the formed elements, breaking down their anatomy, what do they look like, or what's making them up. And then, like usual, talking about some physiology. But you just got a little hint as to the physiology, because we went over some major functions of blood. And so we're going to begin now by looking at that liquid environment. We're going to begin by looking at the plasma. And it turns out, if you were to just get straight plasma will look kind of yellowy pale yes very similar to urine why is it kind of yellowy pale well it's mainly water that's why it's pale when you look at your plasma remember most of your body is water so your blood's no different when you look at plasma it's actually about 90 percent water and you want this why you don't want less water in your blood because it will it will get thicker Kind of think when you dehydrate a liquid, it'll get thicker. Same thing would happen to our blood. You don't want a sluggish blood going through your blood vessels. You want it to go pretty smooth and fast. So you have water almost to dilute it, to decrease the viscosity, make it less thick. You don't want sludge going through your blood vessels. So one part of plasma is water. It's actually most of it. And the other 10% is a mixture of things dissolved in the water. And there are several things. One of the major things dissolved in the plasma, in the watery environment called the plasma, are proteins. You have lots of proteins in your plasma. We call them plasma proteins. And they form what we call the colloid. Colloid is just proteins in the plasma. And we're going to look at the different types of proteins in the plasma. I want you to know the different types of proteins in the plasma and what are they doing first one mentioned is called albumin. Albumin is one of the major proteins in your plasma. It's helping to form this colloid. And the major function of albumin is to help draw and attract and trap water in the plasma. All that water that's making up the plasma had to get there and it was attracted partially by albumin. So kind of think albumin will draw water from other parts of the body and help to attract and trap it in the plasma. That's all we're mentioning for albumin. There are more proteins. Another group of proteins in your plasma are what we call immune proteins, sometimes called gamma globulins, also sometimes called antibodies. Remember, things in this class have lots of names. You could call it an immune protein, a gamma globulin, or an antibody. And if you call it an antibody, you might know what it's supposed to do. Or even if you call it an immune protein, Remember, immune functions are you fighting infections. This is part of your immune system. It's helping to fight infections. Keep going. There are other proteins here. Another group of proteins are what we call transport proteins. And again, they tell you what they're doing in the name. These transport proteins are transporting molecules and solutes surrounding your blood. And then one of the last groups of proteins you have in your plasma are what we call clotting proteins. Again, just look at the name. It's called a clotting protein because it's helping your platelets to clot the blood so that you can stop bleeding. So these are some major proteins in your plasma. Make sure you know them and what they're doing. One more time, albumin is attracting and trapping water in the plasma. Immune proteins, a.k.a. antibodies, are helping to fight infections. Think immune functions. Transport proteins are transporting molecules around in the blood. And clotting proteins are helping you to stop bleeding. It's helping to clot the blood. It's helping platelets. So those are some major things that are involved, are, are located in the plasma, and what they're helping to do. And this table on table 19.1 uh, is, again, just listing structures located in the plasma. All you have to know is water, albumin, immune proteins, transport proteins, and clotting proteins. There are other things in plasma. You do not need to know them. And that's basically it for plasma. The majority of this chapter is spent talking about the cells. 
Okay, the formed elements. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So we're going to slow down and go one by one, again, breaking down their anatomy and then talking about their physiology. And again, you know a little bit about what they're doing. <clears throat> and so we're going to start off with the cell that's making up the most, that you find the most common. We're talking about the red blood cell. Remember, it's also called an erythrocyte. You remember from the beginning of this chapter, I showed you a picture of red blood cells, of erythrocytes. They kind of look like reddish, pinkish discs. Well, when we look at the anatomy, we do, you know, in anatomy, we name everything. We name the shape of a red blood cell. A red blood cell has what we call a biconcave disc shape. Concave means you kind of sink in, a little depression. And it's bi meaning two. Your red blood cell kind of caves in on both sides, and it kind of looks like a disc, okay? When you look at it under a microscope, it might even look like a donut because it looks like it's clear in the middle. Is it clear? No. What you're seeing when you look at red blood cells under the microscope is that the middle is really thin because it's sunken in on both sides, so light can penetrate the middle a lot easier. So when you look at red blood cells under the microscope, they might look like a donut. You're just seeing this feature of having a biconcave disc shape. It's very thin in the middle. Why? Why do we want it to sink in on both sides? Why do you want this biconcave disc? Well... You gotta think way back to the cell again. Remember, whenever a cell has any weird features, it's usually having something to do with the surface area. Think back to things like microvilli. Huh. Well, these biconcave discs, this biconcave sides to the red blood cell is helping yet again, kinda like microvilli, to increase the surface area. Why? It's related to the function of red blood cells. You know, back again from the beginning of the chapter, red blood cells carry and exchange gases. For them to exchange the gases, they exchange the gases with their external environment using their plasma membrane. So to maximize how much gas exchange they have, they have to increase their surface area. And so they sink in in the middle. This little s depression in the middle on both sides actually allows the surface area to be greater than if it were a straight flat surface. So that's why it has this weird shape to it. It's kind of sunken in on both sides. Why? To help maximize gas exchange. And when you think about a red blood cell, it's actually built to do this. It's built for gas exchange and to carry gases. How else? How else do we know? Well, it turns out once a red blood cell becomes mature, it actually spits out its nucleus. It gets rid of its nucleus. So we say mature red blood cells are anucleate, meaning they do not have a nucleus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why? Why do they spit out their nucleus? Well, it's again for gas exchange. You got to remember from AMP1, your nucleus is a large part of the cell. It's a large structure. It's taken up a lot of room. And if your role, your key function is to carry stuff, well, you're going to make room by spitting out things that take up a lot of space, like the nucleus. So we'll see as we go through the life of a red blood cell, we'll see once it hits maturity, it spits out the nucleus in preparation to do its job, which is to carry gases. And when we talk about red blood cells carrying gases, it's really something inside the red blood cell that's carrying the gas. It's really a protein. It's called hemoglobin. I want you to know hemoglobin is a protein inside your red blood cells that's carrying the oxygen. So if you were to cut a red bl blood cell open and look at it, again, here are pictures again. You're seeing the biconcave disc. You're seeing it sunken in. And on this image, they've cut open the red blood cell. And you could see inside, and you see the hemoglobin molecules, these little four little red clusters, are binding to oxygen molecules. So it's really the hemoglobin inside of the red blood cell that's carrying the oxygen. And because of that, we're going to have to talk about it. Oh, yeah, we're going to have to break down the anatomy of hemoglobin. I want you to know the basic parts to hemoglobin. And when you look at hemoglobin, we break it up right away into four major uh, polypeptide subunits. I mean, we break it up into four large repeating chains of polypeptides. 
you got to know the two major groups of chains. There are alpha chains and there are beta chains. When you look at hemoglobin, it has two alpha chains and two beta chains. And that's what you see on this image here. This huge weird cluster is hemoglobin. And you notice there are two kind of these two gold looking clusters, long thread like intertwined clusters up top. And there are two beige looking clusters at the bottom in the cartoon. Those clusters are your chains. You have two beta chains and two alpha chains. And when you look at just one of these chains, you see this little red structure located in the middle. That red structure located in the middle is what we call the heme group. That's another part to your hemoglobin. So it's kind of tells you in the name. It's called heme hemoglobin for the heme groups. This is just uh, another polypeptide that happens to contain iron. That's your heme gr group. And then there are your globin chains. Again, more polypeptides. Those globin chains are your alpha and your beta chains. <clears throat> and when we look at the heme group, I mentioned there's iron inside. And yet again, we got to be more specific. Turns out it's the iron that's really binding to oxygen. So when we talk about carrying gases like oxygen, yeah, we say blood could do it. But now you know it's really the red blood cell in your blood that's carrying the oxygen. Now you know it's really the hemoglobin inside your red blood cell that's carrying the oxygen. And now you know it's really the iron inside of your heme hemoglobin that's carrying the oxygen. And you gotta remember, these are all just chemical reactions. When you have oxygen bind to something, that is a chemical reaction. So when hemoglobin binds to oxygen, you will get a compound, you will get a product. It's called oxyhemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin is just what we call hemoglobin once it's bound itself to oxygen. And so that's one way your red blood cells are carrying gases. It's carrying oxygen really with the iron located in the heme group of all the hemoglobins inside. But remember, we breathe in more than just, we breathe more than just oxygen. We breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. So it turns out your red blood cells could also carry a little bit of carbon dioxide. Not that much, just a little. And again, it's really the hemoglobin carrying the carbon dioxide inside the red blood cell. And again, this is going to be a chemical reaction. So this time, when hemoglobin now binds itself to carbon dioxide, you're going to get a product called carbaminohemoglobin. This is just your hemoglobin when it binds to carbon dioxide. And yet again, there are other gases that could bind themselves to hemoglobin. Turns out it could also bind to carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is C for carbon and O for oxygen. Carbon monoxide is what you typically hear about when you hear someone has passed away in their car with it running. The gases, the fumes coming from the car contain carbon monoxide, and it could kill you. Same thing with when you hear about stories where families have passed away in their homes because there was a leak in their AC unit, and that leak was carbon monoxide. It's a deadly poison. Why? Poisonous gas. Why? It's because it could bind to hemoglobin. Turns out carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin better than oxygen. Carbon monoxide can displace oxygen from hemoglobin, meaning it could literally knock oxygen off of hemoglobin so that it could bind to it itself. This is bad for us. Why? Because we don't use carbon monoxide. When we breathe, we can breathe it in, but our body just won't use it. So when you hear about someone passing away at home or in their car, they were breathing. They were just breathing in a gas their body does not use. That's why this gas is deadly to us. It will push out the gas that we actually need and take up space because we don't use it. So this is really how your red blood cells are carrying gases. It's carrying all these gases mainly with this hemoglobin. That's doing all the work. And so when we got to look at the life of a red blood cell now. We got to go through the life of a red blood cell. And when we look at the life of a red blood cell, we know how long they last. I want you to know the average lifespan of a red blood cell. Just one number. I want you to know that a red blood cell typically lasts 120 days. That's about four months. 
know that number. Red blood cells or erythrocytes typically live to 120 days. Why? Because there are some cells in our body that will live almost as long as we do. So why do these only last a couple months? Well, you got to remember, once red blood cells get older, they kick out some very important organelles, like the nucleus. And so if you kick out your nucleus, you're losing the DNA inside, which contains instructions or blueprints for how to make things. And so as a red blood cell is going throughout the body, it might bump into stuff. It might get damaged. And if it gets damaged, it's not going to be able to repair itself. Why? Because it's lost organelles that are, that are important to, to repair, like all the DNA needed to make proteins if it gets broken. So it's not going to be able to do repair. And because of that, it's going to die rather quickly. That's why red blood cells typically last only 120 days. But no worries. Why? Even though you're constantly losing red blood cells, you're also constantly making new ones. Your body constantly makes new red blood cells, so you don't typically have to worry about running out. So we're going to have to go through how do you make a red blood cell. I want you to know the steps and the progression from making a red blood cell. Don't worry, we're going to go through them in order. We're basically naming the red blood cell at different stages in its development. That's what I mean as, as knowing the progression. Know what we call the red blood cell in different phases of its mat maturation. So we're going to talk about making them. And the process of making red blood cells specifically is called erythropoiesis. And this is just red blood cells. Remember, you have other cells in your blood, white blood cells and platelets. You can make all the cells in your blood. The process of making all the cells in your blood, all the formed elements, is called hematopoiesis. But we're talking specifically about making red blood cells. That's erythropoiesis. And like always, when you're making cells, you got to start off with a cell. You're going to start off with a stem cell. Turns out all three groups of cells in your blood, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, they all start off with the same, start off as the same basic stem cell. And we name this cell. They all start off as a hematopoietic stem cell. That's just a basic stem cell, an immature cell that could become any of your three formed elements. So as we're going through the progression of a red blood cell, the first step is that it's going to be a hematopoietic stem cell. It's going to be a hematopoietic stem cell. And then we're going to have to go through the process of maturing this hematopoietic stem cell into a, a mature red blood cell. And it turns out that doesn't take that long. The process of uh, making your red blood cells typically takes about a week. And it all starts in your bone marrow. That's where you make all your cells initially, in your red bone marrow. As, and it starts off as these hematopoietic stem cells. And then as you progress, your hematopoietic stem cells will then transform or mature into something called an erythrocyte colony forming unit. So again, know the progression. So you're going to start off as a hematopoietic stem cell, and then you will mature into an erythrocyte colony forming unit. And then once it's an erythrocyte colony forming unit, again, it's just maturing. It's just getting older and bigger. It'll mature into what we call a proerythroblast. But in order for this to occur, the cell needs to be told to do this. Ah, oh, remember, how can you boss things around in the body? Remember, you can boss things around in the body using tiny little chemicals we call hormones. So in order for an erythrocyte colony forming unit to mature into a proerythroblast, you need a hormone. I want you to know what hormone is involved in erythropoiesis. It actually gives you a hint of the name. The hormone that helps with erythropoiesis is called erythropoietin sometimes abbreviated EPO. Erythropoietin is just the hormone that helps to stimulate erythropoiesis. How? It's helping to mature those erythrocyte colony forming units into a proerythroblast. And you got to know where this hormone is coming from. Where is erythropoietin coming from? You would think it's coming from the blood, but it's not. Turns out erythropoietin, you might remember from when we did urinary system, 
is coming from the kidneys. Remember, your kidneys have a say on how much blood you have. How? Because your kidneys re- release erythropoietin, and erythropoietin will lead to you having more red blood cells. Why? Because it will tell those erythrocyte colony forming units to mature into proerythroblasts. And then we got to keep going. After you hit the proerythroblast stage, you're still not done yet. You're going to mature into a slightly immature red blood cell. An immature red blood cell is what we call an erythroblast. Remember, blast means immature. Site means mature. So think of an erythroblast as an immature red blood cell. And it's now becoming an immature red blood cell because it's gonna start to have some of those unique red blood cell features, mainly hemoglobin. Once you hit the erythroblast stage, the cell begins to rapidly make lots and lots of hemoglobin in preparation to help carry those gases. And so because it's making hemoglobin, and if you think back to AMP1, remember hemoglobin is also a pigment make things that makes things look kind of pinkish red. So if you have a lot of this pinkish red pigment, you're going to get that unique red color that we give to red blood cells. You're just really seeing all the hemoglobin inside the red blood cells when you look at that red color. And, you, and so when we look at a cell in its erythroblast stage, you're looking at a cell that's making a lot of hemoglobin. It's going to start to begin to look pinkish red. And then after the erythroblast stage, it will mature into, an, into a reticulocyte phase. And in the reticulocyte phase, the cell will finish kicking out all the other organelles. It actually already kicked out the nucleus in the erythroblast stage, and then it will kick out some more organelles in the next phase, which is the reticulite phase. Re- sorry, reticulocyte phase. <clears throat> and this reticulocyte is basically a, a mature red blood cell, but it has not entered the bloodstream. It has not entered a blood vessel. This is all still in the bone marrow. As soon as your reticulocyte enters the bloodstream, then boom, it's a red blood cell. A mature red blood cell. So these pictures, again, we're just going to sum it up and going through these images, going through the progression of maturation for a red blood cell. We're just naming the red blood cell at each step of its maturation. So again, we're in the red bone marrow. You're going to start off as that stem cell, that hematopoietic stem cell that can become any type of cell in the blood, red blood cell, white blood cell, or platelet. And then right away, it needs to pick the pathway that will lead to becoming a red blood cell, how? It will become that erythrocyte colony forming unit. Once it becomes that erythrocyte colony forming unit, it has locked itself into only becoming an erythrocyte, nothing else. So it could begin that maturation. After the erythrocyte colony forming unit step, it's going to become that proerythroblast, how? With the help of erythropoietin, remember you need that hormone. Then after your proerythroblast stage, you'll become, uh, sorry, after your proerythroblast stage, you'll become that erythroblast, that immature red blood cell. And now you can see the color of the cell is changing. Before they show you in the cartoons, it looks kind of bluish. But as soon as you hit that erythroblast stage, its color is changing now. It's getting kind of lighter, pinker, heading towards red. Why? Remember what happens when you're in a erythroblast? You make hemoglobin. So it's going to start to get that unique color to it. And it, what else happens? Not only are you making hemoglo- hemoglobin as an erythroblast, you're also going to start to kick stuff out. Remember, it's the erythroblast stage that kicks out the nucleus. And as soon as you kick out the nucleus, you'll mature into the reticulous side where you'll continue to make more hemoglobin and kick out other organelles. And then you just have that reticulous site enter the bloodstream, enter a blood vessel, enter the blood, and then boom, it's a mature red blood cell. That's the progression. That's how you go from a stem cell, hematopoietic stem cell, to a mature red blood cell. And we saw to do erythropoiesis, you needed some help. You needed a hormone coming from an entirely different organ. Why? Remember I told you your kidneys have a say on how much blood you have. 
Why? Because your kidneys are helping with your homeostatic levels of blood. You got to keep blood in a nice homeostatic range. If you don't have enough blood, that's a problem. It's called anemia. If you have too much blood, that's also a problem. So you want to keep blood in a nice homeostatic range. And your kidneys are going to help. I want you to know how does your kidneys and erythropoiesis help to maintain your red blood cell homeostatic levels? This sounds a lot like feedback. How? Turns out when your blood levels, your red blood cell levels drop, you're going to release erythropoietin from the kidneys to make more. Oh, that sounds like opposites where you were low on blood cell count and then at the end of it, the end result is higher. That sounds a lot like negative feedback because it is. And that's what you're seeing on this slide. So yet again, think back to AMP1, when you talked about negative feedback, remember there were key players. There was the stimulus, the change in the environment. There was something to detect the change, sorry, to detect the stimulus. Remember that was the receptor, which you remember the receptor can't do anything really. So it needs to talk to the control center. And then the control center will come up with a plan but you remember, you need something to enact the plan. Remember, that's the effector. So don't forget those major players. Remember, A and P1 will keep coming back. So let's see how this negative feedback loop works for maintaining your blood levels. So what's the initial stimulus? Well, your blood cell levels get low, but that's not actually what your kidneys look at because your kidneys can't count how many red blood cells you have. So what's the true stimulus to let your kidneys know you do not have enough red blood cells? Well, it's related to the function of a red blood cell. Remember, red blood cells carry gases like oxygen. So if you don't have enough red blood cells, you will not have enough oxygen in the body. Your oxygen levels will drop. Basically, why? Because you basically don't have enough carriers. And that's what your kidneys can notice. So the stimulus for when you don't have enough red blood cells is actually you're going to have low oxygen levels. And your kidneys could detect that. There are, there are cells in the kidneys that act as receptors to detect when oxygen levels are falling. And again, these cells in your kidneys can't hop out of your kidneys and go to the bone marrow to tell it to make more red blood cells. So those receptor cells, those kidney cells, will need to talk to a control center. Turns out the control center is also the kidneys. Why? Because the kidneys are what's making that hormone erythropoietin. So in this case, the control center is the kidneys, and it's going to come up with a plan, and the plan is to make erythropoietin. And then erythropoietin will then go to the bone marrow to stimulate your cells. And so that's really the effector is that erythropoietin doing the work to go to the red, red bone marrow to talk to those erythrocyte colony forming units so that they mature into the pro erythroblast. <clears throat> and, at, and after that, you'll continue the progression to mature into red blood cells and your red blood cell numbers will increase. You'll have more things to carry oxygen. So your oxygen levels will go back up and your kidneys will stop releasing erythropoietin. That's it. So when your oxygen levels drop, cells in the kidneys notice, kidneys release erythropoietin, that then stimulates erythropoiesis. So you make more red blood cells and you could carry more oxygen again. So now you know how to make a red blood cell, you know what it looks like, <clears throat> and how you could help to regulate it, help to control it. And so to kind of finish off red blood cells, we talk about what happens towards the end. What happens when a red blood cell dies? Because when it dies, well, it's still in the blood. You're gonna have to get rid of it. So when we talk about red blood cell, death or red blood cell uh, destruction, we're really going to have to talk about how do you get rid of dead red blood cells. So when a red blood cell dies, it needs to be swept out or gathered out of the blood. And that's actually going to be the job of your spleen. One job of, of spleen is to get rid of destroyed, old, or dead red blood cells. And they'll get trapped in tiny, tiny blood vessels in the spleen, in what we call sinusoids of the spleen. They're just tiny blood vessels in the spleen. 
And once they're trapped in the spleen, well, they need to be removed and broken down. It's going to get rough for them. Turns out they're going to get eaten by another cell. They're going to get eaten by macrophages, which are a type of white blood cell. So what macrophages will phagocytose erythrocytes. They will eat and break down erythrocytes. And when they break them down, they will break them down into all their basic parts. You know the parts now. You know red blood cells, when they're mature, have spit out pretty much everything except for hemoglobin. So that hemoglobin will get broken down. And that hemoglobin, you know the parts to it. Remember, it's made up of heme groups and globin protein chains and iron. So break that all down. Those globin chains, alpha and beta chains, those are just repeating polypeptides. They're proteins. So you're going to break them down into their building blocks, their amino acids, and you'll break down the heme and you'll pull apart those irons from the heme. And everything needs to be pretty much recycled as much as possible. Your body's going to try to recycle all these parts as much as possible, starting with the heme. That heme this is going to get turned into another product. It's going to get turned into another pigment called uh, biliveridin. This is a greenish pigment, and it will also get turned one more time from biliveridin into something called bilirubin. And it turns out your body's going to just excrete the bilirubin. It'll be sent to the liver to help make bile, which will enter your intestines, which you will then poop out. So you'll basically poop out part of your blood a.k.a. the heme, after it's been converted into bilirubin. And this bilirubin is also a pigment. Turns out it will also get broken down and then eventually turn into a brownish pigment, which is the color of what? Oh, uh-huh, yeah, we're going to go there. It's the color of poo. When you look at the brown color in your poo, what you're really looking at are basic breakdown products of this heme. So if your poos aren't brown, if they ever turn an ashy gray color, well, that's actually not an intestines problem per se. That's more of a blood problem. You're not breaking down hemoglobin. So that's one thing. Hemoglobin will eventually get broken down into bilirubin, which you'll excrete, a.k.a. poop out. What else? Remember, there'll be iron. Remember, you're going to pop off iron from the hemoglobin. Turns out your body's going to recycle the iron. You're going to send the iron right back to the bone marrow so it could be used to make hemoglobin for another red blood cell. And in order to bring that iron back to the bone marrow, you're going to need one of those transport proteins located in the plasma. And we named this one. I want you to know this specific protein. It's called transferrin. The job of transferrin is to transport hemoglobin. Or sorry, to transport iron, not hemoglobin. To transport iron. That's it. Transferrin transports iron. And it kind of tells you in the name. It's called trans because it's transporting. And ferrin for ferrous, which is iron. So it tells you in the name. It's a iron transporting protein. And then all those amino acids from all the proteins in the hemoglobin. Well, those amino acids will also get recycled in the bone marrow again to make more hemoglobin for other red blood cells. So when you break down a red blood cell and you break down hemoglobin, almost everything gets recycled except for that heme. It will get turned into bilirubin, which you'll excrete. And that's all this picture is showing you. What happens when you kind of go through the life of a red blood cell? It'll get trapped in the spleen, where it'll get eaten by a white blood cell and broken up into all the parts. Parts of them will be recycled and parts of them will be excreted. Now you know the life of a red blood cell. You know what it looks like. You know what it does. You know how to make it, how to control it, and now how to get rid of it. So to finish off red blood cells, We talk about when things go wrong. Now that you know pretty much everything about red blood cells, we could talk about when things go wrong. And like usual, you might have heard about some of these problems before. They make it into our everyday vocabulary. One major problem is anemia. If you're anemic, you have anemia. And if you've ever been told you're anemic, you've probably been told you have low red blood cell counts or low red blood cell numbers. In anatomy, that's not the definition of anemia. I want you to know what is the anatomical definition. What's going on in anemia according to anatomy? Well, simply put, in anatomy, anemia 
is a decreased oxygen carrying capacity. That's it. When you have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity, that is anemia. Oh, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity? Well, like you just break it down. Your oxygen carrying capacity is simply how much oxygen you could carry. And if it's low, well, that, then you're saying you're not carrying that much oxygen. Why? Well, it, well, it could depend. There are three major causes for a decreased oxygen carrying capacity. There are three major causes for anemia. You could have a decreased hemoglobin count. You could have a decreased red blood cell count. Or you could have an abnormal hemoglobin. And again, you might know some, some of this. We're going to go through those three causes on the next slides. But before we do, let's talk about, again, some general features of anemia. If you've ever been told you're anemic, you might know what it might feel like. You might know some symptoms. If you're anemic, you typically you might experience what we call pallor, which is a paleness. Kind of thing, va uh, vampires are pale. Vampires have pallor. And when you're pale, it's because you're missing the red stuff. You're not seeing a lot of hemoglobin. So you might be pale if you're anemic. Again, think about, think about oxygen. Remember, you need oxygen to make energy, to, to do things like move. So if you're anemic, well, you might be tired. We call that fatigue. Or you might feel weak. Why? Because you're not making enough energy for your muscles. Why? Because you don't have enough oxygen to do it. And your body, remember, your body could tell when your oxygen levels drop. And you're going to see some other changes besides your kidneys making erythropoietin. When your oxygen levels are low, you might notice you're short of breath. Your body's trying to get in more oxygen. You're huffing and puffing, but it's like you can never seem to catch your breath. It's because your body is constantly asking for more oxygen because you're not carrying enough of it around because you're anemic. And so there are many different variations of anemia, all based off those three major causes. But at the end result, no matter what, you don't have enough stuff to carry the oxygen. Maybe you don't have enough hemoglobin, a decreased hemoglobin level. If you don't have enough hemoglobin, you don't have enough stuff to carry oxygen. Maybe you don't have enough red blood cells. A uh, uh, red blood cell count or red blood cell number is what we call the hematocrit. So if your hematocrit is low, you don't have enough red blood cells, well, you don't have enough stuff to carry oxygen. You'll have a low oxygen carrying capacity. Or that last one, maybe your hemoglobin is weird. It's abnormal. If it's abnormal, it's not going to work correctly. It's not going to carry the oxygen the way it's supposed to. And you'll, again, have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity. So you, you might typically hear about different types of anemia, but they're usually linked to these three major causes. And again, your body's going to try to compensate for it. How? You're going to be huffing and puffing, trying to breathe, being short of breath. But if I were to check your pulse, I would notice you'll have a fast heart rate. Kind of think, you don't have enough stuff to carry oxygen. So the stuff you do have, you're going to try to send it around the body faster. That's why your heart tends to beat faster. It's trying to send that little bit of blood or that little bit of hemoglobin that you have around faster to compensate for the lack of, of numbers. And so you might even see a higher cardiac output. Why? Because you remember heart rate is a part of the calculation. So if the heart rate goes up, so will your cardiac output. So let's go through let's go through these three major causes for anemia. Let's see the different variations of anemia based off whether or not it's because of a low hemoglobin or a low red blood cell or an abnormal hemoglobin. And we're going to start off with having a decreased hemoglobin. What type of type of anemia is due to you not having enough hemoglobin? Well, one type is called iron deficiency anemia. I want you to know this. Iron deficiency anemia. It tells you the name. It's really an iron deficiency. Well, how would that lead to us not having enough hemoglobin? You know now. Remember, what's the anatomy of hemoglobin? Well, part of it is iron. So if you're not getting enough iron, well, you're not going to be able to make enough hemoglobin, and you'll be anemic. And it's all technically because of a lack of iron. So we call it iron deficiency anemia. 
And why are you deficient? Oh, it's actually your fault. Maybe you're not eating enough iron. Ten, you tend to find iron not only in meats, but you also find it in green leafy vegetables. Maybe you are eating your food, your, your nice variation of food nutrients. Maybe it's an intestinal problem. Maybe your intestines are struggling to absorb the iron. Yeah. So no matter what, if you're not taking it in or if your intestines aren't absorbing it, you will have a lack of iron. You won't be able to make enough hemoglobin and you'll have decreased hemoglobin levels, aka N leading to a decreased iron capacity, oh, sorry, an oxygen carrying capacity. And you'll be anemic. It's iron deficiency anemia. <clears throat> So another type of anemia related to decreased hemoglobin levels is anemia of chronic disease. You see this in things like cancer, a chronic-based disease. Why? Turns out in chronic diseases like cancer, iron transportation kind of gets disruptive. You can't, your body doesn't really focus on carrying the iron or there might be a, a disease or a virus or a cancer that's interfering with it. No matter what, you're not transporting the iron to the red bone marrow for you to make hemoglobin. So you're going to have low hemoglobin levels and now you'll have anemia. But this is really because of a disease disrupting iron transport. So we call it anemia of chronic disease. <clears throat> What, are, what other things could lead to decreased hemoglobin levels? Well, it could be uh, other situations. Maybe, again, you're not taking enough iron or proteins. Why? Maybe you're malnutritioned and not able to get your uh, enough food sources. Well, if you're not eating properly, you're not going to have the proper ingredients. Your uh, production will decrease. What else? Remember, I told you, it could be an intestines problem. Your intestines need to absorb iron. Maybe they're not doing that correctly. And there's even certain medicines or drugs that could uh, interfere again with you transporting the, this iron. So there are lots of causes for why you might not have hemoglobin. Stick to these two major diseases. Iron deficiency anemia, not enough iron, so not enough hemoglobin. Or anemia of chronic disease. Something is interfering with iron transportation. So not enough iron. And again, not enough hemoglobin. And you will be anemic. Again, there are lots of causes. Let's go on to that, that next cause. Maybe you don't have enough red blood cells. Remember, a low red blood cell number is what we call a low hematocrit. Hematocrit is just a red blood cell number. And so if it's low, you have a low hematocrit. And again, if you don't have enough red blood cells, you're not going to have enough things to carry oxygen. You're going to be anemic. So we got to look at that. How do we have a low red blood cell count? What are some causes to have you to have low red blood cell numbers? Well, one reason is, is a simple one. You might be bleeding. If you bleed, well, you're losing red blood cells. Your red blood cell numbers are going to drop. So think of injuries. Injuries could do it if you cut yourself and you can't stop the bleeding. Or you'll have a decreased hematocrit and you'll um, have anemia. Or maybe you have small bleeds that you don't notice. Think ulcers. A peptic ulcer is a stomach ulcer. And that's when you have a slight little bleed on the inside of the stomach. Well, that's you still bleeding. You'll eventually poop out that blood so you're losing it. And so you're going to have a decreased hematocrit. So if you're ever told you have a peptic ulcer or a stomach ulcer or an intestines ulcer, please ask, ask them to check your red blood cell numbers because it might be low. What's another thing? Maybe you don't have enough red blood cells because you're not making enough. This is called pernicious anemia. And the reason why you're not making enough is actually because of a vitamin deficiency. Turns out to help rapidly make red blood cells. Remember, doing the process of erythropoiesis happens in a week. This is a rapid sequence of events. And there's a certain vitamin that helps you to do these rapid sequences of events. It's called vitamin B12. And if you don't have enough vitamin B12, you're going to go a little slower on making red blood cells. You're not going to be able to do it as quickly and if that's the case, you're not going to have as many red blood cells as you might have optimally had. You'll have a decreased hematocrit. Pernicious anemia is technically when you do not have enough B12. 
Wh- why is that a problem? You won't do as much erythropoiesis as quickly. You won't have as many red blood cells. <clears throat> or maybe your body's destroying red blood cells. When you destroy your red blood cell, that's, that's called hemolysis. So you could have what's called hemolytic anemia. It's anemia due to the destruction of red blood cells. Oh, what could destroy red blood cells? Well, lots of things. If you have an infection, bacteria, well, they could destroy red blood cells. Or you might have an autoimmune disease. Autoimmune diseases are when your white blood cells attack your body. Turns out they can get confused and attack your red blood cells. So if you destroy red blood cells, no matter the cause, that's hemolytic anemia. Or maybe your body just stopped making red blood cells. Your body could stop altogether from making red blood cells. You kind of think it's like your red bone marrow could shut down and completely stop working. This is what we call aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is when your red bone marrow stops making red blood cells. Why? Well, there's, again, lots of causes. Certain medicines could do it. Medications could do it, especially for those on chemotherapy that could do it. Radiation could do it um, as well. And your red bone marrows will stop making red blood cells. That's aplastic anemia. So make sure you know these anemias. There's pernicious anemia due to a lack of vitamin B12. So you're not going to be able to rapidly make red blood cells. There's hemolytic anemia where you're destroying red blood cells. And there's aplastic anemia where you're not even making them at all. Your red bone marrow is not making them. So those are reasons why you might have a decreased hematocrit and then leading to anemia. And then there's the last cause, that abnormal hemoglobin. Well, if your hemoglobin is abnormal, it's not going to function correctly. It's not going to do its job, which is to carry oxygen. And if it's not carrying oxygen, well, again, you'll have a decreased oxygen carrying capacity. You'll be anemic. So we got to look at what are some causes for an abnormal hemoglobin? Well, we look at one up close. It's called sickle cell anemia, sometimes called sickle cell anemia disease. You might have heard of this. What is this? What's going on here? Well, this is a genetic disorder um, due to a uh, defect in the sickle, uh, in the hemoglobin gene, sorry. This is a really a, a, a gene problem for the gene that's responsible for making hemoglobin. They have a, a defective copies of the gene. And these defective copies would lead to an abnormal hemoglobin. How is this hemoglobin abnormal? It gives you a hint in the name. It's called sickle cell anemia. It's because when you look at red blood cells that have these abnormal hemoglobins and you compare them to normal red blood cells, well, they have what we call a sickle shape. A sickle kind of looks like a crescent moon. I kind of think that the sickle, that little knife that the, the death character carries, that's a sickle. Think a crescent moon shape. And the reason why red blood cells have this shape is because of the abnormal hemoglobin. And this is a problem, which you can see on this slide here. Why why does having sickled red blood cells a problem? Well, it turns out these sickled red blood cells, they could get stuck. They kind of think those tipped pinpoint edges of the sickled cell, they're, they're pretty sharp and they could get wedged into things. So as a red blood cell is going through a, a blood vessel, If it's a sickled cell, it might get caught up and then form a plug. Okay, might begin to lead to uh, something similar to a clot. This is bad. Why? When you have red blood cells blocking a blood vessel, well, you're cutting off the oxygen and nutrient supply for wherever those blood vessels were leading. So people with sickle cell anemia tend to go through what we call a sickle cell crisis. That's when your sickled red blood cells have kind of blocked up a blood vessel and now you're seeing tissues die because of a lack of oxygen and nutrients. And this could be very painful from them. Depending on what organ is being affected, you'll see different results. But pain is typically one of those symptoms they feel. Why? Because it's painful when organs and tissues and cells are dying due to a lack lack of oxygen. 
And it's all because the hemoglobin was abnormal and it's not doing its job. And not only is it not doing its job, it's causing red blood cells to block off blood vessels. Yeah. So that's sickle cell anemia. And those are different types of anemia. No anemia in general is a decreased oxygen carrying capacity. No, there's three major causes, decreased oxygen, decreased red blood cell numbers, AKA a hematocrit and an abnormal hemoglobin. And then know the different types of anemia. Do you have anemia because of low iron levels, iron deficiency anemia? Do you have anemia because of some chronic disease like cancer interfering with iron transportation? Anemia of chronic disease. Do you have anemia because you don't have enough vitamin B12? Well, that's pernicious anemia. Do you have anemia because you're destroying red blood cells? hemolytic anemia? Do you have anemia because you're just not even making red blood cells? Aplastic anemia? Or do you have anemia because you have an abnormal hemoglobin due to a dysfunctional hemoglobin gene causing your cells to sickle? Well, that's sickle cell anemia. And that's red blood cells. Again, remember there are three formed elements. We got through red blood cells. Now we got to do the other two. White blood cells and platelets. And the next one we're going on to are white blood cells. And we're going to do the same exact thing we just did for the red blood cell. We're going to go through it, break down the anatomy. What does it look like? Talk about some physiology. Talk about the progression of cells. How do you make white blood cells? And then one more step. Turns out white blood cells, you'll see there are different types. You saw there was really only one red blood cell. It's the erythrocyte. But when it comes to leukocytes, you have variation. So we're going to have to go through and be able to tell the difference between the different types of white blood cells. And then we'll talk about when some things go wrong. So let's go, let's go through white blood cells. Let's go through leukocytes. You already know, again, from the beginning of the chapter, one major basic function they're providing is immune protection. They're helping to fight infections. And we saw when we looked at pictures of the leukocytes at the beginning of this chapter, they're slightly bigger than the red blood cells. But I told you there are different types of white blood cells. So where do we even begin? Like usual, anatomy breaks things up right off the bat into two groups. When you look at all the white blood cells in the body, they fall into one of two groups. There are granulocytes and there are agranulocytes. Oh, what's the difference? They're both white blood cells. They're both bigger than a red blood cell. They're both fighting infections. So what's the difference? It has to deal with what they look like. And they tell you the name. Granulocytes are called that because they contain granules. What's a granule? It's just a fluid-filled sac inside the cell. Only difference is it's not water inside the fluid. It's special chemicals and proteins to help the cell do its function. So if you have these little fluid filled sacs, if you have granules as a white blood cell, we call you a granulocyte. But there are some white blood cells that do not have these granules, that do not have these fluid filled sacs. We call them agranulocytes. So as we go through and look at all these different types of white blood cells, all these different types of leukocytes, we will talk about the granulocytes, the ones that have the fluid filled sacs and the agranulocytes, the ones that don't. So let's begin first by talking about your granulocytes. Again, these are just white blood cells that have these granules. We call them lysosomal granules because they're actually technically lysosomes. Uh oh, I'm going to think back to AMP1. Remember, a lysosome was a type of organelle in a cell. It was an organelle filled with fluid, not water, at least not only water. And then I told you, in this case, these lysosomes, these granules are filled with chemicals that will help the cells do what they need to do. And we're going to have to be able to tell these cells apart. For lecture and lab, you're going to have to be able to tell what these cells look like. You got to know the anatomy of your different types of white blood cells and the physiology. So know what the different types of white blood cells look like and what they do. And we're starting off with granules. And one major way to tell a lot of these different cells apart is actually color. As you go through all these slides, you notice that all these cells have different colors to them. When we look at white blood cells, you'll see them in the next coming slides. These cells don't have these colors normally. 
the colors that you're going to see as we go through white blood cells are all thanks to stains we put on the cells when we're looking at them under the microscope. We use dyes to help give these cells some color. Because remember, they kind of give you a hint in the name. They're called white blood cells for a reason. Because they don't really have a visible color for us. So to help differentiate these cells, we stain them with different dyes. Because turns out some of these cells are better at picking up different dyes than others. And we usually use two major dyes. There's something called methylene blue. Gives you a hint. It looks kind of blue. Actually, technically, it looks kind of bluish purple. It is methylene blue. So we'll notice some of your white blood cells look kind of purplish blue. It's because they picked up the methylene blue dye. They're not that color in real life, or at least not in your body. And another type of dye we use is eosin. Eosin kind of looks pinkish red. So when we're, whenever we see any white blood cells that look pinkish red under the microscope, it's because they picked up the eosin dye. So just keep that in mind as we go through these different types of white blood cells. So one major type of granulocyte, one major type of white blood cell that has granules is what we call a neutrophil. Once you know a neutrophil. What does a neutrophil look like? If you go a, a little ahead, you'll see uh, some pictures showing all three major types of granulocytes, and one of them is the neutrophil. And when you look at this cell, well, it has a slightly pinkish, sometimes lilac color. Why? Lilac is kind of light purple, and sometimes it might even look pinkish. Why? It actually picks up both the dyes, but it typically sometimes picks up the eosin a little better depending on the slide. So if you're using different images other than histologyguide.org or your textbook, neutrophils might seem pink. That's because they're just picking up a little extra eosin dye. But so that's not going to be a real identifying feature. This lilac color is not a feature you should use to help memorize an, a neutrophil. So what's a better way to tell a neutrophil apart from all the other cells? Well, it has to do with another feature. It has to do with the nucleus. Turns out when you look at the nucleus of a neutrophil, it gets broken up into different segments or pieces, all still connected by sl small strands, but it's like it's been broken up into pieces. We call them lobes. When you look at a neutrophil's nucleus, its nucleus is typically broken up into anywhere between three to five lobes. And so we'll see pictures in a second, but when you look at a neutrophil, first an easy thing to do is count how many pieces is the nucleus broken up into. If it's broken up into anywhere between three to five pieces, three to five lobes, it's a neutrophil. And we give a name to this feature. When your, when your nucleus breaks up into different uh, segments or lobes, we say you're a polymorphal nucleocyte or a polycell or a PMN. This is a polymorphal nucleocyte. A neutrophil is a polymorphal nucleocyte. It has a nucleus that is broken up into three to five lobes. So that's typical anatomy, and it's a granulocyte. When you look inside this cell, you'll see tiny little speckles, kind of like little dots scattered around the cell's cytoplasm. Those dots, those speckles, are the granules. They look like little pinpoint dots. So when you're looking under the microscope, if you see a cell bigger than a red blood cell, whose nucleus is broken up into multiple pieces, those two things alone let you characterize it as a neutrophil. All right. So now that you know its basic anatomy, oh, what does it do? Well, you know it fights infections, but we gotta be more specific. Because remember, there are multiple white blood cells. They all fight infections. And you have different types of white blood cells because they help to fight the infection in different ways. So what's the major function of a neutrophil? Turns out neutrophils help to kill bacteria. That's their major function. Neutrophils straight up kill bacteria. So whenever you have a bacterial infection, it's neutrophils coming to help fight the, that infection. How? They're going to kill the bacteria. They straight up eat it. They kill the bacteria. But if you're wondering, how do neutrophils even know where the infections are? Let's say you get an infection in your big toe. How do your neutrophils know to go to the big toe to fight the infection? It's weird, but it's true. Turns out... It's like neutrophils could sniff out a chemical trail. When bacteria or, or any type of pathogen enters your body, they make chemicals, they're alive, they make chemicals, 
and your neutrophils could follow this chemical trail to find them. We give a name to this process. When neutrophils follow a chemical trail to locate the source of an infection, that's called chemotaxis. This, again, this break down the name, chemo for chemicals, taxis like taxis, meaning you're moving, transporting. This is basically the moving based off a chemical trail. And this is how your white blood cells, specifically your neutrophils, will find an infection. I want you to know what is chemotaxis. So your neutrophils following a chemical trail to find the source of the problem. And once they find the source of the problem, like I mentioned, they'll just straight up kill the bacteria. They fight specifically bacterial infections. So if you get a fungus infection or a viral infection, neutrophils will not help. It is just for bacteria. They kill bacteria. That's their job. That's it. That's neutrophils. Let's go on to another type of granulocyte, another type of white blood cell that has the tiny specks on the inside. It's called an eosinophil. Turns out when you look at this cell, it'll look kind of pinkish red, especially its granules will look really pinkish red. Why? It gives you a hint of the name. It's called an eosinophil because it picks up that eosin dye, that pinkish red dye. So this cell will look kind of pinkish red. And when you look at its nucleus, oh, look at that. Its nucleus is also broken up, but this time only into two lobes. When your nucleus is broken up into two lobes, we say you have a bilobed nucleus. Remember, a neutrophil will start off with at least three lobes. So if you see three, it is not an eosinophil, it is a neutrophil. If you only see two, it is an eosinophil. Okay. <clears throat> and again, when you look inside the cell, you'll see those little specks. Again, you'll see granules. So that's a basic anatomy. And when you look at the bilobe nucleus, when you look at the nucleus broken up into two pieces, at least to me, usually kind of looks like Mickey Mouse ears inside the cell. Just two little round structures inside the cell. Those are the bilobed nucleus. <clears throat> so you know what an eosinophil looks like. So what's the function? Why do you have this type of white blood cell? Well, this type of white blood cell does two major things. It can fight parasites like worms. So we say parasitic worms, but not just worms, other parasites. And it causes allergic reactions. So it does two things. It fights and kills parasitic worms and it causes allergic reactions. So when you touch that poison ivy and your skin plumps up or you eat that shellfish knowing you're allergic to it and your face swells, all that allergic reaction you're feeling when you sneeze, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes, you could blame your eosinophils. And again, those granules inside the eosinophils are just containing chemicals to help it do, it, do its job. It's containing chemicals to help fight the parasites and to help cause your allergic reaction. So that's eosinophils. That's simple. And then the last major type of granulocyte is called a basophil. A basophil. When you look at this one, it's going to look kind of purplish blue because it's picking up more of the methylene blue dye. And according to your textbook, it says it has an S-shaped nucleus. I'm going to let you know right now, I have never seen that S-shaped nucleus under the microscope. Why? Because it's covered by something else. Let me give you a hint. It's a granulocyte. So when I look at a basophil under the microscope, I could barely see the nucleus. Why? Because it's covered with little specks, with little granules. So when you look at this cell, it's typically going to be a big bluish purple cell covered with bluish purple little dots and speckled, covered with granulocytes. That's it for the key features for a basophil. And now that you know what this cell looks like, again, what is the function now? Turns out this cell is going to help with inflammation. It's going to mediate inflammation and allergic reactions, meaning it's going to help to cause inflammation and allergic reactions. Yeah. Just like an eosinophil. 
So those are your three major groups of white blood cells. Those are your three major granulocytes. When you look at all of them, they will all have granules, but I'll let you know to me when I'm looking under the microscope, it's easier to see the granules in eosinophils and basophils. It'll be a little harder sometimes, depending on what slide you're using, to see them in neutrophils. So, but don't worry, there are other key features. You see them all in this picture here on figure 19.8 in your textbook. It shows a typical look to all three of these cells. Let's go through it one more time. This is gonna help a lot with lab. We're on your lab exam. You're gonna have to tell these cells apart based off the images, images of blood. So let's remind ourselves about the key features of neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Starting with the neutrophil. Remember, this is a polymorphonucleocyte. Remember, its nucleus is broken up at least into three pieces, anywhere between three to five lobes or pieces to the nucleus. And you can see that in this picture here. When you look inside the cell, you see the dark clusters. Those are the nuclei, nucleus. And you see on this particular image, I'm counting at least one, two, three segments. They are all still connected by small little cytoplasmic bridges. You do not need to know what is a cytoplasmic bridge. They're just little segments of the nucleus connecting the three different parts. But no matter what, you're gonna see three, at least three clusters. And that's what I see in this image here. So right off the bat, Three to five uh, lobes to nucleus alone is a key identifying feature for a neutrophil. Then there's the eosinophil. Remember, this is eosinophil because it's picking up the eosin dye. So you can see from the picture, it's looking a little pinkish red. And when you look inside, you see the nucleus is broken up into two segments as a bilobe nucleus. To me, it kind of looks like little Mickey Mouse ears inside the cell. That's a classic look, pink cell, with two lobes to the nucleus, only answer is eosinophil. And then the last major type of granulocyte is the basophil. Remember to me, I cannot see that S-shaped nucleus. I know they're pointing to it in the image. I could barely see it. Don't use an S-shaped nucleus to help you to identify it. You will struggle. The easier thing you're gonna see is what I told you, a big purple bluish cell with lots of little specks covering it with lots of granules, that's it. That is a basophil, bluish purple cell, lots of specks, lots of granules covering it. So make sure you could tell them apart and know their function. Neutrophils are using chemotaxis to locate and kill bacteria. Eosinophils are fighting parasites, worms, and causing allergic reactions and basophils are causing inflammation and also some allergic reactions. That's your granulocytes. Then there's the A granulocytes. They're the white blood cells that do not have a nucleus. And luckily it's just two of them. There's something called a lymphocyte and a monocyte. So we're just gonna talk about lymphocytes and monocytes. When we look at both of them, they will both kind of look clean on the inside. They will not have those specks. Why? Because they do not have granules, okay? So we're gonna look at them both, starting off first with the lymphocyte. Uh, what's a key feature for this? Lymphocytes and monocytes, when you look at them under the microscope, will look kind of bluish purple because they both typically pick up the methylene blue dye. So a lymphocyte is gonna be a slightly purplish bluish cell. And when you look at the nucleus, it's solid, it's not broken up into lobes. It has one huge nucleus. It's, the nucleus is so big, it's taking up most of the room inside of the cell. And when you look inside the cell, you're only gonna see a little bit of the cytoplasm kind of peeking out on the sides. So we say when you look at a lymphocyte, it has a large spherical nucleus and a light blue rim of cytoplasm. You're gonna see a light pale area kind of around the nucleus. That's just you see in the rest of the cell. That's a typical look to a lymphocyte. And a lymphocyte does multiple things. Why? Because there are actually multiple types of lymphocytes. There are two major types of lymphocytes. I want you to know the two major types of lymphocytes. And again, what are they doing? What are their functions? And they're both helping to fight infections, by the way. So don't use that. They're doing something specific. 
Okay. And there, if you're wondering, how do white blood cells even notice there's a problem? We know, we saw that things like neutrophils could follow a chemical trail. But what about things like lymphocytes? Well, it turns out lymphocytes look for something specific. They look for something called an antigen. It's just a marker, meaning it's a protein that your body's cells could kind of read. And these antigens help cells to figure out who's who and who belongs to who. So when a, a cell enters your body that's not yours, your body will know because it will read the antigens on the cell. And it will notice that that cell doesn't belong to you. And it could even read the antigens, the markers, the proteins on the cell to tell who's who. So, but again, I want you to know the different types of lymphocytes. There are two of them. There's something called a B cell and something called a T cell. Also called a B lymphocyte instead of B cell or a T lymphocyte instead of a T cell. So let's look at a B cell. Let's look at a B lymphocyte. What's the function? It is still a lymphocyte. So when we look at it, it will be a purplish blue cell with a large nucleus and a little bit of the cytoplasm peeking out on the sides. So what's the function? It has one simple function. The function of a B cell is to make antibodies. Oh, we just saw that earlier in the chapter. Remember, an antibody is just an immune protein we see floating around in the, pla in the plasma to help fight infections. And like most things in your body, it needs to be made. It gets made by the B lymphocyte, by the B cell. B cells make antibodies. And that's it. Keep it that simple. B cells make antibodies. And when they make antibodies, they're making it t toward or to these antigens. They're making it to fight the antigen. Remember, your body will read an antigen. If it notices, notices an antigen does not belong to you, B cells will make antibodies to fight it because it assumes those antigens belong to some cell that doesn't belong to you, and your body will try to get rid of it. But again, keep it simple. B cells make antibodies. And then there's the other type of lymphocyte. It's called the T lymphocyte. Again, it's a lymphocyte. So when you look at it, it's going to be a purplish blue cell with a huge nucleus and a little bit of the cytoplasm peeking out on the sides. So the major difference here is, again, what's the function? Turns out functions of T cells are a little weird because there are actually multiple types of T cells. We'll see them next chapter when we do lymphatic system. <clears throat> but for now... Just simply know that T cells will kill other cells. Why? Oh, there's reasons. It's not just killing any old cell. A T lymphocyte will kill an abnormal cell, a cell that's not working correctly. A cancerous cell, yeah, a cell that might form cancer. Or, typically, an infected cell. Those are the cells that a T cell tends to get rid of. Kind of think if a cell gets infected with a virus, that virus can spread to other cells, just like how humans could spread viruses to other humans. Turns out your cells could spread viruses to other cells. So once one cell gets infected, oh, you're not going to like it. Your body's going to be told to kill that cell. Your T lymphocytes will go and kill infected cells to prevent the spread. <clears throat> or it will kill a cancerous cell, or just a straight-up abnormal cell. So those are your major lymphocytes. B cells are just making antibodies, and T cells are killing other cells for good reason. Infected cells, abnormal cells, or cancerous cells. And then the last type of white blood cell we look at is a monocyte. A monocyte. Again, it's going to be kind of bluish purple because it picks up the methylene blue dye. But what's a key feature to help us know we're looking now at a monocyte? Well, it's back to the nucleus again. Turns out when you look at the nucleus now of a monocyte, it has a U-shaped nucleus, a horseshoe-shaped nucleus. That is a key feature. You're going to see a big purplish blue cell with a horseshoe-shaped or U-shaped nucleus. That is a monocyte. And you've actually been talking about monocytes before, especially in AMP1. Why? You've seen examples of monocytes. An example of a monocyte is a macrophage. So whenever you talked about macrophages in AMP1 or in AMP2, 
you were actually talking about monocytes. You were talking about white blood cells that have a, a horseshoe-shaped nucleus. So what's the function? What's the function of a macrophage? What's the function of a monocyte? It is super simple. These are phagocytic cells, meaning they're going to eat things. These cells will eat other cells, dead cells, dying cells, bacteria, antigens, even debris, garbage. These cells eat whatever does not belong. And you saw that a couple slides back when we talked about a red blood cell. When it dies, who ate the red blood cell? Who removed this thing that no longer needed to be there? It was the macrophage. They eat whatever doesn't belong. That could be a dead cell a dying cell, a bacteria, antigen, garbage, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't belong, macrophages will eat it, break it down and destroy it. That's how macrophages, that's how monocytes work. They ingest, they eat, they phagocyze things that don't belong. And again, make sure you can identify these cells. Remember, stick to key identifiable features. And that's what you see on this picture here in figure 19.8 in your textbook. The lymphocyte I mentioned is a purplish blue cell. And again, you see the nucleus is huge. It's taking up most of the space. And you see a little bit of the cytoplasm peeking out on the side, kind of like a little crescent moon. That's just some of the cytoplasm peeking out. Typical look for a lymphocyte. And then down below, you see the monocyte. Again, it's a purplish blue cell. But remember, the key feature was the nucleus. And you can see on this one, it has a nice and easy to identify horseshoe-shaped nucleus, a U-shaped nucleus. So that's it for your A granulocytes. So now you know what all your white blood cells look like and what they all do. Make sure you know the look, the anatomy, and the function for each of your specific white blood cells. So now that we know what they look like and what they do, again, we're doing the same thing we did for a red blood cell. Now we got to talk about how do you make them? Oh, remember the process of making all of your cells is hematopoiesis. Remember making just an erythrocyte, just a red blood cell is called erythropoiesis. So guess what we're going to call the process of making white blood cells, leukocytes. We're going to call that leukopoiesis. So leukopoiesis is the process of now making white blood cells. And you actually know the first cell we're going to start off with. It's the same first cell we started off with for blood. Because you remember, there's one stem cell that makes all the cells in your blood. Remember, it's the hematopoietic stem cell. So that's, again, the same cell we're going to start off with now. And again, this cell could become any of the three cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. We saw that it committed itself to become an, uh, an erythrocyte as soon as it became an erythrocyte colony forming unit. That's when it committed itself to become an erythrocyte. Well, in this case, we're going to have to pick it to become a white blood cell. Turns out I didn't mention this before, but when your hematopoietic stem cell needs to choose, the first thing it needs to choose is one of two pathways. There's one of two cell lines, meaning pathways of maturation. If you want to become, let's say, a lymphocyte, either a B or a T lymphocyte, doesn't matter, you got to pick the lymphoid line. The lymphoid line is the pathway or progression of cells that you'll mature into to eventually become a, a lymphocyte, either a B or a T. If you want to become any other cell in the blood, a red blood cell or any of the other types of white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, or monocytes, you will pick the myeloid cell line. All right. So when we're going through leukopoiesis, we got to talk about both these cell lines because the myeloid cell line, yes, it could lead to an erythrocyte, but it could also lead to a neutrophil eosinophil, basophil, or monocyte. And we have to talk about the lymphoid pathway, which is super simple, kind of gives you a hint in the name. The lymphoid pathway would lead to lymphocytes. So let's go through it. And let's start off first with how do you make your granulocytes? How do you make things like neutrophils, eosinophils, 
and basal fills. And like usual, I'm going through this in order of the slides, but there's a slide that kind of summarizes all of them, shows figure 19.9, shows leukopoiesis and how you would end up with all your different types of white blood cells if you want just a nice little flow chart. But I'll just go through your slides in order, starting off with how do you make granulocytes. So start off again, you know the first step, start off in the red bone marrow with your hematopoietic stem cell. And then you wanna become either a neutrophil, eosinophil, or basophil. So let's go on. So you start off as a hematopoietic stem cell, then you pick the myeloid pathway, and then the next step is to progress, to mature. You're gonna mature into what we call a myeloblast. And this myeloblast is just an immature version of those neutrophils, eosinophils, and potential basophils. And then it's gonna progress into what we call the promyelocyte phase. And then once it leaves the promyelocyte phase, it needs to eventually commit itself to becoming one of those three cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, or basophils. It will do that in its band cell stage, sometimes called its stab cells phase. This is when that promyelocyte will finally determine if it's going to become a neutrophil, eosinophil, or basophil. And each of these different groups will have band cells. So if you want to become a neutrophil, you're going to start off again as the hematopoietic stem cell. Then pick the myeloid pathway, become a myeloblast, then a promyelocyte then you're gonna become a neutrophil band cell. And then you'll progress and mature into a uh, mature neutrophil. If you wanna become an eosinophil, start off with a similar same pathway, hematopoietic stem cell, then pick the myeloid pathway, then become a myeloblast, then mature into a promyelocyte, and then you become an eosinophil band cell. And then the basophil does the same thing. Start off as a hematopoietic stem cell, pick the myeloid pathway, become a myeloblast, then a promyelocyte, and then, be, then you will become a basophil band cell before you mature into a full mature, uh, a basophil band cell before you mature into a full blown mature basophil. So the, for all your granulocytes, it's the same order. Hematopoietic stem cell, pick the myeloid pathway, then a myeloblast, then the promyelocyte, then you have your band cell stage, either a neutrophil band cell, eosinophil band cell, or a basophil band cell. And then you'll finally mature into that granulocyte, neutrophil, eosinophil, or basophil, and enter the bloodstream, just like how we saw with the red blood cell. And that's how you make your, your granulocytes. But then there's the 1A granulocyte that also picks the myeloid pathway. Remember, there's also the monocyte. And it's very similar. Again, it starts off with the hematopoietic stem cell. It again also chooses the myeloid pathway. But then after it chooses the myeloid pathway, the monocyte will become what we call the pro-monocyte. After, uh, after the myeloid pathway is picked, it becomes a monoblast, then a pro-monocyte, and then it simply matures into a mature monocyte and enters the bloodstream. So that's the monocyte, very simply. Hematopoietic stem cell, pick the myeloid pathway, become a monoblast, then a promonocyte, and you'll simply mature into a monocyte. There is no band stage, there's no band cell stage for a monocyte, only for the, for the granulocytes, only for neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And then there's the lymphocyte. Remember, again, it's going to start off with the hematopoietic stem cell phase, and you're going to eventually have to break up into a B cell, a B lymphocyte, and a T cell, and a T lymphocyte. And their names actually give you a hint. They're called B and T cells for a reason. You're going to begin to make them both in the bone marrow, in the red bone marrow. But to finish maturation, one of these cells needs to leave to finish maturation. Let me give you a hint in the name. B cells finish their maturation in the red bone marrow. They're made there and they'll stay there to mature. That's why they're called B cells for the bone marrow. But your T cells, even though they do start off getting made in the red bone marrow, they need to leave to finish the maturation. They need to leave and finish maturing in the thymus. I want you to know, 
T cells mature in the thymus while B cells mature in the red bone marrow. That's why T cells begin with a T, it's for thymus. They're actually telling you in, in the name where they go for maturation. And it's very quite simple for, for a, a lymph, lymphocytes progression. Your lymphocyte, again, just like any other cell, is gonna start off with a hematopoietic stem cell, and then it's gonna pick the lymphoid cell line. It's gonna pick the lymphoid pathway. And it's very similar to what we saw for the monocyte. For the lymphocyte, after it picks the lymphoid pathway, it will have a blast phase, an immature phase. It will become a lymphoblast. Then after the blast phase, it will have what I call the prophase, where it becomes a pro-lymphocyte. That's why I call it the pro, because they have pro in the name. And then after that, it matures, just like a monocyte, into its two mature cells. They just had to go somewhere else to finish. So one more time, a lymphocyte starts off as a hematopoietic stem cell, then picks the lymphoid cell line, becomes a lymphoblast, then a pro-lymphocyte. B cells will stay in the bone marrow and become B lymphocytes, while T cells will go to the thymus before they become T lymphocytes. And they'll mature and then enter the bloodstream like all the other cells. So now you know leukopoiesis. You know now how to make white blood cells. So now you know all the white blood cells, what they look like, what they do, and how to make them. So like usual, to finish off white blood cells, we talk about when things go wrong. And one thing that could go wrong with your white blood cells is cancer. Some of the cancers that form are cancers of the blood, cancers of blood cells, mainly cancers of your white blood cells. We call them leukemias. Leukemia is a cancer of your leukocytes. Remember, cancers are just when you have cells growing uncontrollably. So think of leukemias of, as you having white blood cells that are, con are growing uncontrollably. And remember, when it comes to white blood cells, you got a lot of different types. You have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, um, lymphocytes, and monocytes. And you remember, when they were being made, they di chose different pathways. Remember, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and monocytes all pick the myeloid pathway, while your lymphocytes pick the lymphoid. Why do we care? When we're talking about cancers, well, this is this kind of this line of progression, what line, cell line you choose, will influence the type of cancer we're talking about. We name some of these cancers based off the cells causing the problem. For example, there are some cancers that are classified as lymphocytic cancers. A lymphocytic cancer kind of tells you the name. It's a lymphocytic cancer because this is where your lymphocytes are growing uncontrollably, usually B lymphocytes. Or you can have a cancer where the other white blood cells are growing uncontrollably. The white blood cells that originated from the myeloid pathway. So if you have a cancer that originates from cells in the myeloid pathway, we call that a myelogenous cancer. So that's one way to ca uh, classify cancers, is which cell line did these abnormally growing cells come from? The lymphoid line, lymphocytic, or the myeloid line, myelogenous. Again, this is anatomy. We have lots of ways to classify things. Another way to classify cancers is based off how fast the disease is progressing. How quickly are these cells growing and making other cells and spreading throughout the body? Well, it's one or two um, breakdowns. It's either a, an acute leukemia or chronic. If you're a, uh, an acute leukemia, well, it means it's spreading rapidly, it's spreading fast. Whenever you hear the word acute in anatomy, that means usually, typically less than 24 hours, or rather, quickly. All right. So if you are told you have an acute le leukemia, you have a leukemia that's spreading and growing, progressing quickly. Well, on the other hand, some people get leukemias, cancers, that grow very slowly. Think more than 24 hours in anatomy is typically what chronic means. But in this case, it means slow. So if you're ever told you have a chronic leukemia, you're being told you have a cancer that's growing and progressing slowly.
So when we think of names to a lot of your leukemias, they're literally telling you what's going on. For example, children typically get what's called ALL, which is an acute lymphocytic leukemia. Just break down the names. This is acute. It's going to happen fast. It's lymphocytic. It's coming from your lymphocytes. And it's leukemia. They're growing uncontrollably. This is a cancer of lymphocytes that happens very quickly in kids. So when you think about them, you just break them down. Another type of leukemia is called AML, which is acute myelogenous leukemia. You again, just break down a name, acute, fast, myelogenous, because it's coming from your myeloid line. And again, it's a leukemia. So when you think about different leukemia names, they're either telling you how fast is it progressing or where did the cells come from? What line? And these are all cancers. And if you don't treat them, they will spread. Remember when a cancer spreads, when the cells go to other parts of the bodies and go to other tissues, we say that it's metastasized. To metastasize just means to spread. And so you want to treat cancers before they're spread or try to catch the spread as early as possible to save that person. And you will treat leukemias like any other aggressive cancer. They're going to need chemotherapy, possibly radiation therapy, or maybe possibly surgery as well. That's leukemia. That's some things that could go wrong with white blood cells. So now you know all about white blood cells. And then to finish off, we look at the last major formed element in your blood. It's your platelets. Remember when we looked at blood under the microscope at the beginning of this chapter, your platelets were the tiny little, little, almost look like fragments, little pinpoint dots kind of scattered around, lots smaller than red blood cells. Why? Well, it's kind of tricky. Turns out platelets technically are not cells. Technically, platelets are pieces of a cell. They're cell fragments. All right. So when we get into how do you make platelets, we're actually going to mention a name of a different cell. And the platelets will be pieces of this cell once it breaks apart. Don't worry, we'll get to it eventually. But for now, just know platelets are actually cell fragments. They're not even full-blown cells. And again, you already know major functions for this cell. Remember, it helps, to, helps you to stop bleeding. And we actually give a name to this. This process that stops blood loss to stop bleeding, it's called hemostasis. Hemostasis is the process of you stopping blood loss, stop bleeding. And so we say platelets do hemostasis. Platelets help you to stop bleeding. And they're going to help you to stop bleeding because they have certain proteins and chemicals that help them to do it. It's because platelets also have granules. They have tiny little fluid-filled sacs that contains lots of chemicals and proteins to help them to do the process of hemostasis, to help them to get you to stop losing blood, to stop bleeding. So when we, if you we were to cut open a platelet, which is what you see in this figure, 19.10, section A, this is a picture of a platelet cut open. You can see there's not much going on inside. All the little blue little specks inside are the granules, the fluid-filled sacs. And other than that, it might have a few microtubules to help give it a shape and then mitochondria for energy. But that's about it. So these cells, you can see they don't really have that many organelles. So they're not going to live that long. Turns out, when we look at the life of a platelet, it only typically lives for about a week. It only lives for about 7 to 10 days. So when we go through the process of making platelets, this, when you think about it, it's going to have to happen rapidly so that the cell can then go on to live its life and perform its function and then die. It has to do all this within a week. So this has happened pretty quickly in your body. So let's go through this process of making platelets. Let's go through this process called thrombopoiesis. It's called thrombopoiesis because another name for a platelet is a thrombocyte. So you could call a red blood cell an erythrocyte, a white blood cell a leukocyte, and a platelet a thrombocyte. So the process of making thrombocytes, the process of making platelets, is now called thrombopoiesis. And yet again, you know the first cell you're going to start off with. It's the same exact cell. Remember, there was one cell that made all the other cells in your body. Remember, it's still 
the hematopoietic stem cell. And you know the next step. Remember, you need to choose. Are you going to become a lymphocyte or any other cell in the body? Well, we're not talking about lymphocytes. We're talking about one of the other cells. So to become a platelet, you also have to choose the myeloid cell line. You have to choose the myeloid pathway. And then once you choose the myeloid pathway, you need to begin the processes of maturation into other cells that would eventually lead to a platelet. So what do you become? So you're going to start off as a hematopoietic stem cell. You're going to pick the myeloid pathway. And then you're going to become what we call a megakaryoblast. This is the immature version of the cell that will eventually break up into the platelet. So for thrombopoiesis, it will become a hematopoietic stem cell. Then a megakaryoblast. And then this megakaryoblast is going to have to become humongous. It's going to grow. It's going to grow in size by doing lots and lots of mitosis, except it's not going to split into daughter cells. It's not going to do cytokinesis. So it's making tons and tons of copies of DNA. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but it's not going to split into two cells. In fact, its name is going to change. Once a megakaryoblast does does tons of mitosis, makes lots of copies of DNA and gets extremely big, it is now mature and we call it a megakaryocyte. And these megakaryocytes are the cells that will break up into platelets. So when we said platelets were a fragment of a cell, a platelet is technically a fragment of a megakaryocyte. So the progression is super simple for a platelet. Hematopoietic stem cell, pick the myeloid pathway, become a megakaryoblast, then a megakaryocyte, and that megakaryocyte will break up into platelets. Super simple. But how? How do you get this one huge cell to break up into tiny, tiny pieces? Like always, you kind of know. What's a chemical that could boss things around again? It's a hormone. Turns out to get a megakaryocyte to break up into platelets, you need a hormone. Once you know this hormone, it's called thrombopoietin. It's very similar to erythropoietin. Remember, erythropoietin helped to stimulate erythropoiesis. Turns out thrombopoietin will help to stimulate thrombopoiesis. How? It's going to stimulate your megakaryocytes to break up. So how? How does it do it? What happens when a megakaryocyte gets a signal from thrombopoietin? It's weird, but it's true. They're going to send tiny cytoplasmic extensions into a blood vessel. Meaning when you're looking at a megakaryocyte, it's going to look like it has a creepy little arm sticking out. And that arm-like structure, aka that cytoplasmic extension, is going to reach into a blood vessel. And as soon as that cytoplasmic extension reaches into the bloodstream, it will break apart. It will shatter into pieces. And those pieces that it shatters into is a platelet. And that's how you make platelets. And because it's a piece of a megakaryocyte, it's not having all the organelles. It's not going to live that long. It's going to live for about a week. So that's the simple progression. Hematopoietic stem cell, pick the myeloid pathway, become the megakaryoblast, become the megakaryocyte, get a signal from thrombopoietin and send an extension into the bloodstream, which will then break into pieces. And those pieces are called platelets. And those platelets will help you to do hemostasis. They'll help to keep you from losing blood. And when they die, well, you got to get rid of platelets also. You can't just have dead platelets floating around in your blood. So you need to remove them. Turns out both your liver and your spleen could do it. We already know spleen can remove old, dead red blood cells. Turns out it will also remove old and dead platelets as well. And the liver could do that too. So now you know the process of making platelets. And again, that's what you see on this little flow chart on figure uh, 19.10, section B. It's just showing you the progression of cells you go through to make a platelet. So now you know all the cells in your blood. You know what they look like, what they do, 
how to make them, and in some cases, even when things go wrong. And this figure on 19.11 is just showing you almost all these things we talked about. What do they look like? What do they do? It even gives you the... Um, the prevalence, meaning how common are they in the blood, and some other facts like their size. No, you do not need to know their size. To finish off platelets, though, we need to talk about one last thing. We got to focus in on the function, that function of getting you to stop bleeding, that process of hematostasis. Turns out it's pretty complicated, and luckily you don't have to think about this. This is what your body does for you. But for our class, oh yeah, we got to know it. I want you to know the steps of hemostasis in order and what happens in each step. And you can see that all on this slide here. There are five major steps, five major parts to hemostasis. In order, it's a vascular plug, then a platelet plug, then something called coagulation, then clot retraction, and thrombolysis or thrombolysis. Those are the five major steps of hemostasis. Make sure you know them in order and what happens in each step. Don't worry, we're gonna go step by step in order and talk about them on the next couple slides. And we're going in order. So we're gonna start off with the first step. So let's say you're, cu you're cooking dinner and you happen to cut your finger and you start bleeding. What's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna need to stop the bleeding. What is your body going to do? Don't think about you holding, putting compression on it and putting on a band-aid to get it to stop bleeding. Don't think about what you do as the organism. Think about what your cells and your bodies, think about what your platelets, your blood vessels are going to do. Okay. So let's say you're bleeding and you need to stop. What's the first step of hemostasis? Turns out the first step is called vascular spasm. Again, don't be intimidated by the name. Just break it down. It actually tells you in the name what's happening in this step. It's called a vascular spasm. Remember, vascular is for vasculature, which is your blood vessels. So the first step involves your blood vessels. They're going to spasm. How's that? When they spasm, they're meaning they're going to vasoconstrict. They're going to decrease the size of their diameter. Why? Because I told you, when, you, when you're bleeding... You've cut a hole in a blood vessel. That's why you're bleeding. Blood is literally pouring out of a hole in your blood vessel when you bleed. And so the first step to try to control and stop the bleeding is to get the blood vessel with the hole in it to pinch off its diameter, to decrease its diameter so you're sending less blood into that blood vessel and so you'll minimize blood loss to help maintain your blood pressure. So the first step, as soon as you begin to bleed, blood vessels will vasoconstrict. They will decrease their diameter. You will have a vascular spasm. Why? You're trying to decrease blood loss. And that's all you're seeing in this picture here. Uh, blood loss is the result of literally a hole in the blood. And to make sure less blood leaks out, you're gonna vasoconstrict that blood vessel. You're gonna decrease its diameter so less blood lose, gets lost. That's only the first step. Because after the first step, you can see from the picture, you still have a hole in the blood vessel. And blood is still leaking out. It's just not as much as initially. So we now need to begin the process of closing off that hole in the blood vessel. Now that you've kind of minimized blood loss by vasoconstricting, by the vascular spasm, you now need to begin the process of repairing the hole. And you'll begin in step two with what we call a platelet plug. Before we get into it, its name right off the bat kind of tells you what's going off, going on here. Basically, platelets are coming, on, coming over to help close and seal off the hole. They are going to plug up the hole. So we got we to gotta go into it and see how does this happen. How do you get platelets in step two to come and kind of plug up the hole? Well, first step, you got to remember you've damaged a, a, red, a blood vessel. And when you damage blood vessels, you damage the cells making up the blood vessel. Uh-oh. Think back to blood vessels. <clears throat> Remember, yes, a lot of them have multiple layers to them. But one layer of your blood vessels is endothelium. Oh, remember, endothelium is just what we call simple squamous epithelium when it's lining the inside of a blood vessel. So when you look at endothelium, you're going to see your endothelial cells. You're going to see your simple squamous epithelial cells. 
And when you damage a blood vessel, these cells get damaged because you have to poke a hole through them. When you get a hole in a blood vessel, it's because you've poked a hole through these endothelial cells. You've damaged these cells. And when they get damaged, when they get injured, they release chemicals. And one of the chemicals they release, or really in this case, a protein that they release when they get injured is called von Willebrand factor. So as soon as you cut yourself, you're going to get a vascular spasm and then your blood vessels are going to release von Willebrand factor. What is this going to do? Turns out von Willebrand factor will bind to receptors on the, pl on the plasma membranes of platelets that are passing by in your bloodstream. And when it binds to the receptors on the platelets, it's going to cause the platelets to to get sticky. They'll go through some chemical reactions that will result in your platelets getting really sticky. And they'll begin to stick to that area. Not only will they stick to that area, platelets, as they continue to pass by, will also stick to other platelets until you have this aggregation of platelets that have stuck together and begun to seal up the hole. We give a name to this. When you have von Willebrand factor binding to platelets to cause them to get sticky, we give a name to it. It's called platelet activation. So kind of thing, von Willebrand factor activates platelets. How? It causes them to get sticky so they can begin to kind of stick together and plug up the hole. All right. Don't worry about uh, activated platelets releasing uh, granules, all right, containing chemicals to help them do what they need to do. You don't need to know that. Keep it simple. In step two, in platelet plug formation, you've damaged endothelial cells. They release von Willebrand factor that binds to platelets and activates them and makes them sticky. And once platelets get sticky, they'll begin to stick to each other, clump together. When platelets clump together, we say they aggregate. So they will aggregate once they're activated. They will clump together and form a plug that will seal up the hole in the blood vessel. But this is only a temporary plug. So yes, it will stop the bleeding, but only temporarily. And so that's what you see in this picture here in figure 19.3. During the platelet plug formation, again, you're going to damage endothelial cells. They're going to release von Willebrand factor which will bind to platelets, cause them to get sticky. As other platelets come by, they will also bind to von Willebrand factor, also get sticky, till you have this big cluster of platelets all stuck together, sealing this hole. That is your platelet plug formation. And yes, this is a really good plug, but again, I told you it's a temporary plug. Why? Because, uh, you know, there are more steps to hemostasis. We gotta keep going. We gotta go on to now to step three. And this third step is going to be a rather long process so with lots of other steps. Just simply put, it kind of tells you the name. It's coagulation. To coagulate means to thicken. Kind of think a clot. This is when you're going to form your blood clot. This is when the blood is going to thicken. And when it comes to coagulation, there are two pathways for it. <clears throat> There are two pathways that would lead to you thickening the blood. And I want you to know the difference, excuse me, between these two pathways. There's the intrinsic pathway of coagulation. And there's the extrinsic pathway. What's the difference? They are both the uh, pathways that would lead to you thickening the blood. The major difference between them is really how you get started. That's the major difference. And they kind of give you a hint in the name. One is called intrinsic because this is really things happening inside the blood that are going to help to thicken the blood. While the extrinsic pathway will start off with some things that are located primarily outside of the blood. Okay. But again, keep it simple as we're about to go through these two major pathways. So their major difference is what they start off with. Why? Because towards the end of these pathways, they're going to come to a common final pathway. They're going to both result in the exact same thing happening in the end, which is the activation of a specific protein we call fibrin. Fibrin is a thread-like protein <clears throat> that's going to be responsible for thickening the blood. It's going to take that platelet plug 
and it's going to thicken the blood in that area to help seal off the, the hole in the blood vessel a little better. But in your body, fibrin is not active. It's in your body. It's typically in its inactive form. We call that fibrinogen. And you want that. You don't want fibrin to be active in your blood because if it for no reason. Because if it was active in your blood for no reason, it will be going around clotting blood in random places and you'll have strokes and heart attacks and things. So to keep you from having unnecessary clotting, fibrin is typically held in its inactive form. And once you get a damage to a blood vessel and you begin this third step, you begin what we call the coagulation cascade, you'll eventually activate this protein to help seal the plug. So as we go through the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways or the coagulation cascade pathways, you're just seeing how we're going to activate this protein. And as we go through the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, it's going to seem complicated but keep it simple. It is just a series of activations. As we're going through the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, all you're gonna see is that one protein will activate another protein that will activate another protein until you get to the fibrin protein that you're gonna activate. It is just a series of protein activations for both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. You got to know the order of activations. So we're going to go slow and we're going to go one by one. And in order to activate proteins, you're going to use other proteins. You're going to use proteins located in the plasma. And these proteins are, I told you, are helping to clot the blood eventually. So guess what we call these proteins in your plasma that help to clot blood? We call them clotting proteins. Remember, those were some of the proteins in your plasma. So these are the proteins we're about to mention. As we're activating one protein and activating another protein, we're just activating all these different clotting factors, all these different clotting proteins located in your plasma. And they have weird names to them, lots of different names. The ones in your textbook uses the Roman numeral names. Yeah. So when I say things like factor two or factor seven, factor nine or factor 10, these are just the clotting proteins located in your plasma. You got to know the order of activation. Remember, these are just going to be a series of activations. And you're activating them, uh, or you're using these proteins. And these proteins need to be made. Turns out to help make these proteins as you're activating them, you're going to need a vitamin. I want you to know what vitamin is used to make your clotting factors, your clotting proteins. It's vitamin K. So it turns out some people with a deficiency of vitamin K might uh, not be able to stop bleeding because they might not be able to form their clotting factors or their clotting proteins. Just know that vitamin K is needed to synthesize certain clotting factors. Which ones? Factor two, seven, nine, and 10. If you do not have vitamin K, you will not be able to make factor two, seven, nine and 10. Make sure you know that. But back to the cascade, back to the intrinsic and ex extrinsic pathways. What's going on? Again, keep it simple in your mind. You're just going through a sequence of activations leading up to the activation of fibrin. Okay. So we're starting with the intrinsic pathway. And I mentioned before, it's called the intrinsic pathway because now all these clotting factors I'm mentioning are coming from in the blood already. It's inside. To be intrinsic means you're internal, inside. So we're already starting with things inside the blood. So what's going to happen? So again, you're cut yourself. You've broken a blood vessel, put a hole in it. You've already done your vascular spasm. You've already formed your platelet plug. What else is going to happen? Turns out when you damage a blood vessel, yes, endothelial cells will get damaged and yes, they will release von Willebrand factor. But you remember your blood vessels have multiple layers to them. And some of the layers of your blood vessels contain connective tissue and connective tissue structures like collagen. Turns out when you damage or poke a hole in a blood vessel, collagen fibers will be exposed. They'll stick out. And when those collagen fibers stick out, they're going to activate one of your uh, clotting factors, one of your clotting proteins. Turns out these collagen fibers are going to activate factor 12. 
when factor 12 is activated, we call it 12A. Kind of think that A is for activated. Then this factor 12 is then going to activate other proteins. Remember, it's just a series of activations. Factor 12 will then go on to activate factor 11. And when you activate factor 11, its name is going to be called factor 11A. Again, think A for activated. And factor 11A is then going to activate again another protein. In this case, factor 11 will activate factor 9. Okay. And once factor 9 is activated, factor 9 will combine with another factor. Factor 9 will combine with factor 8. And along with calcium, they will activate factor 10. So factor 9, factor 8, and calcium will activate factor 10. That is the intrinsic pathway. It is just a series of activations. Know them in order. One more time. Collagen will activate factor 12. Factor 12 will activate factor 11. Factor 11 will activate factor 9. And factor 9... Factor 8 and calcium will activate factor 10. And that's the end to this pathway's unique pathway. All right. If you're wondering, what's the numbers? Why don't the numbers seem to go in order? Well, we named the factors, or they, the scientists who initially found them, named the factors in order uh, of discovery. And we found that once we knew a little bit more about them, they actually work in a different order than the order we found them. So don't focus on number order. The numbers are not in order of this pathway. They're in order of discovery of when we found them. So factor 12 was the 12th factor we found, but turns out it's the first factor activated. Okay. So don't get distracted by the numbers. The numbers are just names. Okay. So one more time for the intrinsic pathway. When you damage a blood vessel, collagen fat... Collagen gets exposed, and collagen will activate factor 12. <clears throat> factor 12 will activate factor 11. Factor 11 will activate uh, factor 9. Then, factor 9, factor 8, and calcium will activate factor 10. And that's the end to your intrinsic pathway. And that's all you're seeing on this picture on figure 1914. You're just seeing the sequence of activations. One more time, you see it in the picture. Exposed collagen factors will activate factor 12. Then factor 12 will then go on to activate factor 11. And then factor 11 will go on to activate factor 9, which will combine with factor 8 plus calcium to activate factor 10. And that is the end to the intrinsic pathway. You have not activated um, fibrin yet. You can see the intrinsic pathway stops at factor 10. Okay. Then let's reverse and do the same thing now for the extrinsic pathway. And again, its name gives you a hint. Remember, this one's called extrinsic because it's starting off with things outside of the blood. It's actually started off with the damaged blood vessel again. <clears throat> again, Let's say you're cooking, you poke a hole, you cut yourself, you poke a hole in the blood vessel. You've already done your vascular spasm. You've already formed your platelet plug. What happens now in the extrinsic pathway? Well, in the extrinsic pathway, now we're looking at damaged cells again in the blood vessel. In this case, we're looking at what we call subendothelial cells. These are just cells in the blood vessel, okay, making up the blood vessel. These cells, when they get damaged, just like your endothelial cells, they will release something. They will release a protein. In this case, your damaged subendothelial cells will release a protein called tissue factor. Remember, this is just the name. It's another type of factor like factor 9, 10, 11, 12. Tissue factor is another clotting protein. And again, this is just a sequence of activations. So your subendothelial cells will release tissue factor, and tissue factor will go on to activate factor 7. And you remember, when it becomes activated, we put a little A on it. So tissue factor will activate factor 7 into 7A. And then factor 7 will go on to activate something else. Turns out factor 7 will combine with tissue factor and calcium 
to activate factor 10. So if you notice, at the end of both your intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, the end result is that you activated factor 10. That is their common pathway. They are both leading to the activation of factor 10. Okay, so that's the major difference. It's just really the beginning. How do you start? And again, we see the picture now for the extrinsic pathway on this picture here in figure 1914. Again, you damage the blood vessels. In this case, subendothelial cells release tissue factor. Tissue factor will then activate factor seven. And then factor seven will combine with tissue factor plus calcium to activate factor 10. So at the end of both your intrinsic and extrinsic pathway, you have activated factor 10. Why? Uh, what do we need factor 10 for? This whole thing, again, is just a sequence of activations. And so after your coagulation cascade, aka after your intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, by the way, they are both working at the exact same time to activate factor 10, You'll then take ta factor 10 to activate, to activate another protein. Factor 10 will activate a protein called thrombin that's also held in its inactive form called prothrombin. So if, once you activate factor 10, it will activate prothrombin into its active form thrombin. And then thrombin will activate fibrinogen into fibrin, which will then clot the blood. And that's the coagulation cascade. That's step three. It is just a series of activations leading up to the activation of fibrin. And that's all you saw ending on this picture in figure 1914, part three. You're just seeing factor 10 activate prothrombin into thrombin. And then thrombin will activate fibrinogen into fibrin, which will then form the uh, mesh to clot the blood. So again, it's just a series of activations. One more time, remember intrinsic and extrinsic pathways work together at the same time to activate 10. Remember intrinsic factor will have collagen activating 12. Factor 12 will then activate factor 11. Factor 11 will then activate factor nine. Then factor nine plus factor eight and calcium will activate some factor 10. At the same time, in the extrinsic pathway, your subendothelial cells are releasing tissue factor, which will then activate factor seven. And then factor seven plus tissue factor and calcium will also activate some factor tens. And then the factor tens will activate prothrombin into thrombin. And then thrombin will activate fibrinogen into fibrin. And then once you have your active fibrin, fibrin will accumulate to kind of thicken and seal off the blood. And you will stop bleeding. And you'll see this usually after some time as a scab. When you look at a scab, you're just looking at old dry blood plus this fibrin mesh. This mesh form of fibrin to help thicken and clot the blood. And that's your scab, your clot. And then your body will go on to the next step. <clears throat> which is step four, which is called clot retraction. And like always, it kind of gives you a hint in the name. Now, this is when your body is going to begin to get rid of the clot. Why? Because it's done its job. So to finish off sealing up that hole, you need to now bring the edges of that hole together. You need to bring the nice, still intact parts of the blood vessels together to kind of pinch off and seal off the hole. And that's going to be the job of clot retraction. And to do this, well, it's going to actually be the job of your platelets yet again. Yeah. Turns out inside your platelets, they have some contractile proteins, two proteins you've seen before, actin and myosin. Oh boy, now here comes the AMP1 again. Remember, actin and myosin were contractile proteins in your muscles that allowed them to contract, to shorten. Remember, to shorten your muscles is really how you're moving. Well, it turns out your platelets also have actin and myosin. And they will also allow your platelets now to contract, to shorten. And when your platelets in the wound, in the hole that they're plugging up, contract, they're going to pull the edges of the blood vessel together to kind of help seal it up, zip it up. They're pulling. And at the same time, as they're pulling and squeezing these two, these edges of the blood vessel together to close off the wound, 
it's going to squeeze the clot, that fibrin mesh. And when it squeezes the clot, it's actually going to force liquid out of the, out of the clot. It's going to force se- what we call serum out of the clot. This is just fluid uh, consisting of plasma located inside of the clot. And during clot retraction, when you're squeezing the clot because you're bringing the edges of that broken blood vessel together, it's going to force some of this serum out. It's going to force out this liquid that was trapped in the clot. And the clot will kind of dry out, kind of decrease in size as you're pinching off the wound. And that's clot retraction. You're just removing the clot from the wall. How you're bringing the edges of the wall together by having actin and myosin allow the platelets to contract, decrease their size, and drag the edges closer. And the clot will retract. It'll basically lift up off that area because you've now sealed the hole by pulling the blood vessel edges together. That's it. That's simple uh, clot retraction. And then to finish off, you do the last step. You do thrombolysis. <clears throat> Again, just break down the name. Don't be intimidated. Lysis means to break. So thrombolysis is when you break that clot up. Yeah. That throm- throm- thrombus. A thrombus is a clot in the blood. You're going to break it up now because now the hole's gone. You sealed up the hole by pulling the edges of the blood vessel together. So now you could get rid of the clot. Fem- fibrinolysis. Yeah. And it turns out to do, or sorry, thrombolysis. To do thrombolysis is really you getting rid of your fibrin mesh. You breaking down fibrin, that glue that was holding everything together to thicken the blood. So really, when you think of thrombolysis, getting rid of your clot, you're really getting rid of fibrin. You're really breaking down fibrin. So you're really doing fibrinolysis. So we're going to have to talk about it. How do you break down fibrin? How do you do fibrinolysis? Well, like always... It's going to be the job of another protein in your body. To initiate this process of removing your clot, you're going to need something called TPA. Stands for tissue plasminogen activator. Turns out TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, is coming from the blood vessel. The endothelial cells of the blood vessels. Now that the blood vessel is now sealed off, your endothelial cells now know you need to get rid of your clot, they will release TPA. And this is very similar to how you form the clot. It's just a series of activations. As soon as you have TPA, it will then go on to activate plasminogen into its active form called plasmin. And plasmin is a protein that could actually break down fibrin and dissolve the clot. So to do this last step, thrombolysis, Okay, fibrinolysis specifically, you're just activating proteins. Your endothelial cells will release TPA. TPA will activate plasminogen into plasmin. And plasmin will do the work of breaking down fibrin and dissolving the clot. And you're done healing. So that's all the steps that happen. You can put it all together now. In this figure in 1916, it's just showing these last steps. You see the TPA coming from the endothelial cells. TPA is activating plasminogen into plasmin, and then plasmin will go to work dissolving the clot, breaking down fibrin and dissolving the clot. And that's what happens when you cut yourself. You'll go through all five of these steps to seal the wound, and then eventually your body will get rid of the clot. And you remember, when it comes to the names of all these clotting factors, all these clotting proteins, the names are numbers. Yes, there are other names to them. On your exam, I'll be using the number names, okay, just like I went through it with you. And so now you know how to control hemostasis, how to, how to control this process of stopping bleeding. But like always, there are things that can influence it. There are things that could regulate whether or not you could clot. Well, we got to go through some factors that could regulate whether or not you could clot. And some of these things are coming again from the blood vessel cells again. A lot of these things are also coming from endothelial cells. Not only do endothelial cells get involved in the process of clotting, they could also regulate clotting. For example, your blood vessel cells, your endothelial cells, could prevent platelets from sticking together. 
Just like how you don't want fibrin being active in your body, accidentally clotting stuff, you don't want platelets to stick to blood vessels that don't need them. So to prevent or inhibit platelet aggregation, to keep platelets from sticking together, your endothelial cells release a chemical called prostacyclin. I want you to know this chemical. Prostacyclin inhibits platelet aggregation. It inhibits platelets from sticking together. So you hopefully you don't have to worry about having random clots if you have your cells working correctly, if your endothelial cells correctly make prostacyclin. Don't worry if you don't have that. There are other ways to control clotting. Turns out your endothelial cells could release another chemical. Turns out they could release something called nitric oxide. I want you to know the effect nitric oxide has. Turns out the effect of nitric oxide is actually on the blood vessel itself. Turns out nitric oxide can cause vasodilation. Remember vasodilation is when you increase the, the diameter of a blood vessel. So in this case, sometimes your blood vessels could dilate. They could vasodilate. They could get bigger, again, to prevent coagulation and clotting. How? This time with nitric oxide. Okay. So, so you have ways to prevent platelets from coming together. You have ways to make the blood vessel bigger, again, to prevent platelets from coming together. But what if you miss that step? What if, uh-oh, your body allowed platelet plug to form and now you're going on to your coagulation cascade? Can you prevent coagulation? Can you inhibit coagulation? Turns out, yeah. And again, it's thanks to your endothelial cells and some cells in your liver, some hepatocytes. Okay? But focus on the, the substances, the chemicals. So what are some things that could inhibit coagulation and how? <clears throat> First up is another protein. In this case, it's called antithrombin. Antithrombin tells you the name. It's antithrombin. It will inhibit thrombin. It will prevent your body from activating thrombin. Remember, you needed thrombin to activate fib fibrin. And so if you don't have thrombin, you will not activate fibrin and you will inhibit coagulation. Keep it that simple. Antithrombin inhibits the activation and activity of thrombin. Antithrombin inhibits the activation and activity of thrombin. It's keeping thrombin from doing its job and you won't coagulate. What else is there? Uh, there are some medicines that could help you uh, to inhibit coagulation. You might know them as blood thinners. Whenever you hear the word a blood thinner, that's just a medicine that's going to inhibit coagulation. It tells you the name. Remember, to coagulate is to thicken the blood, to clot the blood. Well, a blood thinner is doing the opposite. And an example of a blood thinner is called heparin. Heparin is a medicine that basically enhances the activity of antithrombin. Heparin kind of supersizes antithrombin. So it's basically doing the same thing, or at least helping to inactivate thrombin, to keep it from doing its job. And then the last thing you could give to someone that might be coagulating that you want to stop is just a protein called protein C. <clears throat> protein C uh, can degrade or break down some other clotting factors. Mainly, protein C could break down something called factor five, and factor eight. Remember we saw factor eight in the intrinsic pathway helping to activate factor 10. So if there's no factor eight, you will not activate factor 10, you will not activate thrombin, and you will not activate fibrin, and you will not clot. These are all ways to keep you from coagulating, to keep you from clotting. Antithrombin inactivates or prevents the activity of thrombin and prevents its activation. Heparin allows antithrombin to do more of its job. It enhances the activity of antithrombin. And protein C can help to break down things like factor eight. And these are all things that will help to keep you from coagulating. Okay. <clears throat> Again, there are other proteins involved that could help uh, to remove or regulate clotting, which is what you see in table 19.3. You do not need to know all these. Just stick to the ones I just mentioned. Prostacyclin, inhibiting platelet 
uh, aggregation, sticking together, nitric oxide, dilating a blood vessel, antithrombin, inhibiting thrombin, heparin, helping antithrombin, and protein C, helping to break down factor eight. Keep it that simple. And so now you know how to clot the blood. Now you know how to keep from bleeding. So like always, we could talk about when some things go wrong. <clears throat> We're talking about problems with clotting. We're talking about clotting disorders. And when it comes to clotting disorders, there are two major groups, or two major types of clotting disorders. There's a bleeding disorder, and there's a hypercoagulable disorder. Okay. These are two problems with clotting blood. Okay. So let's go through them one by one. <clears throat> and like usual, their names kind of give you a hint. Starting off with bleeding disorders. It's telling you the problem. Bleeding disorders are when you're bleeding. You have increased blood loss. You're bleeding and you usually can't stop it. You cannot clot the blood. You've probably heard of examples of bleeding disorders. Major example is hemophilia. Hemophiliacs, when they start to bleed, it's extremely hard for them to stop. Now you know why. Hemophilia is a bleeding disorder where they're unable to clot the blood or they're not able to do it efficiently. And when it comes to hemophilia, there's actually two types of hemophilia. I want you to know the difference between the two types. There's hemophilia A and there's hemophilia B. The major difference is the cause. Why are they not able to clot the blood here? Well, it turns out hemophilia specifically is due to a deficiency in clotting proteins, those clotting factors. Turns out in hemophilia A, you do not have enough of factor VIII. And in hemophilia B, you do not have enough factor IX. Remember, you needed both factor VIII and IX to activate ten. So if you don't have either one, you're in, you're a, a hemophiliac. Don't have factor VIII specifically, hemophilia A. Don't have factor IX specifically, that's hemophilia B. Those are bleeding disorders. They'll bleed because they don't have the clotting factors to do coagulation. And then there's a different group of disorders. We call them hypercoagulable states. <clears throat> hypercoagulable, hyper means a lot, coagulable means clotting. This is when the body does a lot of clotting. Okay, so think clots. An inappropriate amount of clots, too many clots in your body, is called thrombosis. Thrombosis. That's a type of uh, result of a hypercoagulable state. You would have too many clots. You would have thrombosis. <clears throat> and remember, a clot is just what we call a thrombus. So having lots of thrombi is thrombosis. Mm -hmm. And this is bad. Remember, having thickened blood, having a clot will block off blood vessels. You will limit oxygen and nutrient supplies to organs and tissues, and they will die. So you don't want unnecessary or an inappropriate amount of clots. You do not want thrombosis. So let's look at some um, specific dis uh, problems that are related to hypercoagulable states and this thrombus and this clot. Remember, we're just naming clots, basically. Turns out when a clot breaks off, sometimes a clot could break off and enter the bloodstream. Sometimes a thrombus could break off the wall of a blood vessel that it was sealing a hole to and enter the blood. We call that a thromboembolism. So when a thrombus, aka a clot, breaks free from the blood vessel and enters the bloodstream. This is just a floating clot in your bloodstream. We call that a thromboembolism. That's bad because it could eventually clog up a small blood vessel. <clears throat> Another type of hypercoagulable state is what we call a DVT. A DVT stands for a deep vein thrombosis. It tells you exactly what's going on in the name. This is when you have thrombosis, unnecessary clots, in a vein deep inside the body. You usually see this in veins in the legs. All right. Whenever you hear someone has a DVT in their leg or anywhere, you're just hearing that they have a thrombus in a vein. It's like having a thromboembolism specifically in a vein. That's a DVT. But you can have this thromboembolism in other places. You can have it in blood vessels in your lungs, in your pulmonary system. All right. When you have a uh, clot in the blood vessels of your lungs, we call that a pulmonary embolism. 
necessary. So these are just definitions. Make sure you know these definitions. Unnecessary are too many, an inappropriate amount of clots, too many clots, thrombosis. Just a straight up clot, thrombus. A clot that has broken free and is now in the bloodstream, call it a thromboembolus. If you use a different textbook, they'll call it an embolus. Is the clot in a vein deep in the leg? Call it a DVT. Or is it a clot located in a blood vessel of the lungs? Pulmonary embolism. And don't worry, if you ever get diagnosed with one of these things, remember we can break down clots. Remember one of the last steps is uh, th thrombo thrombolysis. You could break down a clot. All right. And we saw there were certain medicines that could help us to do it. We saw heparin helping to uh, increase the activity of antithrombin. So if I notice you're having clots, I could just give you some heparin. Hopefully that will help to break stuff down and prevent more clots from happening. Or I could give you other blood thinners. You might have heard of people that are on a medicine called warfarin, sometimes called coumadin. This is another type of blood thinner. Turns out this one is going to attack those clotting factors that are reliant on vitamin K. Oh, you remember you needed vitamin K for factors 2, 7, 9, and uh, 12. So warfarin is specifically inhibiting the production of factors 2, 7, 9, and 12. That's why people on warfarin are, are told to watch their vitamin K sources because you're trying to prevent them from making these clotting factors. Why? Because they already have too many clots. And we're giving all these medications for people who have too many clots or to prevent clots. You could even give medicines to really fight platelets. One example is aspirin. You might have heard... Uh, a tip for older individuals is to take an aspirin a day if you're at increased risk for a stroke and a heart attack. Why? You're about to know why. Turns out aspirin inhibits the enzymes that allow platelets to stick together. It inhibits enzymes that allow for platelet aggregation. That's why people take aspirin. If you take aspirin, your platelets in your heart's blood vessels won't stick together and they won't clog up the blood vessels of your heart and you hopefully won't have a heart attack. That's why people are taking aspirin, baby aspirin once a day. And there are other medicines as well. Well, we could actually give people synthetic forms of some things like TPA. Remember your body makes TPA, but we could also make it in the lab. And if I give you TPA, that will also help you to prevent clots from forming. So that's coagulation and, and some medicines used to help with some coagulation problems. Then to finish off our chapter on blood, we look at blood transfusions. Now that you know pretty much all about blood, what it looks like, the parts, and what all the parts do, <clears throat> and how you could control them, we could finally bring it back to the organism. What if you lost blood and you needed blood? Well, you could get blood. Process of giving and receiving blood is what we call a blood transfusion. And in a blood transfusion, there's always the person who gave the blood, and there's always the person who's going to receive it. And this is anatomy, so we name everything. We give a name to the person that donated the blood, and we give a name to the person that received the blood. The one that's going to give the blood, donate the blood, is called the donor, and the person that's going to receive the blood is called the recipient. So whenever you're doing a transfusion, you're always taking blood from the donor and giving it to the recipient. But if, if you've ever been involved with a blood transfusion, you know it's a little bit more complicated. Why? It has something to do with blood types. Not everyone has the same type of blood. Everyone has a different blood type, and we name the types. Don't worry, we, are, we will talk about blood types in a couple slides. But everyone has different blood types. And if you get the wrong blood type, that could actually kill a person. So you want to make sure whenever you're doing a blood transfusion, you're giving blood to someone that can receive it. You got to do what we call blood type matching. So how do I do that? How do I even, in the beginning, tell what type of blood I have? For example, I'm O positive. What does that mean? How do you know someone's blood type? Well, it has to deal with what's on the surface of the cells. There are markers. There are antigens. 
Oh, remember we talked about antigens. Remember they're markers on the surface of cells like bacteria, but it turns out everything has antigens, not just things not in your body. Every single cell in your body has antigens. And you remember your body could read an antigen, so to speak, to tell who a cell is and who that cell belongs to. So your body can literally look at a red blood cell and read antigens to tell who that cell is and whether or not that cell belongs to you. So when we are donating and receiving blood, we need to make sure these antigens and antibodies are compatible. All right. So the first step in talking about a blood transfusion is talking about these blood types. There are several different blood types. We're going to focus on the ABO group types. For example, I told you I'm a type O. Some people are type A. Some people are type B. There are also people that are type AB. What does it mean to be that? What does it mean to be a type A, type B, type AB, or a type O blood? Again, it's dealing with antigens. It's dealing with proteins on the surface of the cells. These proteins on the surface of the cells are called antigens. And each grouping or each type will have different antigens. And they have the antigens and the types tell you in the name. If you are a type A blood, it's because you have A antigens on the surface. A is just the name of the antigen. And that's also the name of the type. So type A blood types have A antigens when you look at their red blood cells. If you're a type B, well, it means you only have the B antigens on, your, on the surface of your red blood cells. And if you're a type AB, like you see on this picture, well, then it means you have both the A and B antigens on the surface of your cells. Okay. Oh, but what about my favorite person? Oh, what about me? I told you I'm a type O. So that means if you were to look at the surface of my red blood cells, you actually won't see either of those antigens. My red blood cells will not have A or B antigens on the surface. So that's all it means. The, ty- the first part of the name of your blood type is just telling you what are the names of the proteins, what are the names of the antigens on the surface. Type A's have A antigens. Type B's have B antigens only. Type AB's have both the A and B antigens on it. And type O's don't have either. They are missing the A and B antigen. But that's not the only part to your, to your blood type. I told you I'm O positive. Okay. Not only is there the letter part to your blood type, there's also the symbol. You're either positive or you're negative. Oh, what does it mean to be positive or negative? Well, it still has to deal with the antigens. Turns out there's one more antigen that might be present on the surface of your red blood cells. It's called the RH antigen, or you could call it the D as in dog antigen. If you have the RH or the D antigen, we call you positive. And if you do not have the RH or the D antigen, we call you negative. So as you go through each type, there's an A positive and a B negative, or A negative. There's a B positive and a B negative. There's an AB positive and an AB negative. And there's an O positive and an O negative. All these names are just dealing with the antigens, the proteins on the surface of the cell. So we could break it down. If you are A negative, it means all I'm going to see on the surface of your cells are A antigens. Or, for example, if you're like me, you're O positive. All I'm going to see on the surface of your cells are the D antigen or the RH antigen. That's all it means. And when it comes to your blood types, turns out there are some types that are more common than others, depending on where you are. Your blood types are typically geographically linked. Why? Because they're genetically linked and people tend to live close to their family. So wherever you see a certain community, they'll see one blood type over another. For example, in the United States, the most common blood type is actually O positive. Uh Uh-oh, turns out I'm not that special when it comes to blood types. I'm like a lot of other people. While in the United States, AB negative is the least common blood type. And if you were to go to a different part of the world, you'll see their blood type, most common and least common, might be slightly different from ours. But what do I want you to know? I just want you to know your different blood types what antigens are on the surface, 
What antibodies are there? We'll talk about that in a minute. Who can you give blood to? And who can you receive blood from? Okay. So you already know antigens. They pretty much tell you in the name. If you have A, you have the A only. B will have B only. A, B will have both A and B antigens. And O has neither of them. If you're positive, you have the D antigen. And if you're negative, you don't. So O negative, for example, if you were to look at it, has none of the antigens. O, so it does not have the A or B. And negative, it does not have uh, the D antigen either. Mm -hmm. So you know the first part. So we got to move on to the second part. You got to know what antibodies each blood type has. Oh boy, what antibodies now? Remember, antibodies are coming from your B cells, your B lymphocytes, uh, to help fight infections or any antigens that don't belong to you. Okay. And these antibodies have other names. Remember, we saw them as gamma globulins or immune proteins floating around in the plasma, or you could call them agglutinins. Why? Why can you also call them agglutinins? It's, what, it's because of what they cause. Turns out antibodies, when they come in contact with an antigen that does not belong to you originally, they will cause cells to stick together. When cells, mainly red blood cells, stick together, we call that agglutination. They agglutinate. So we say uh, antibodies are agglutinins. They cause agglutination. They cause cells to stick together. And this is bad. You do not want red blood cells to agglutinate. Why? Because it will promote hemolysis. It will cause red blood cells to rip themselves apart. They will, they will burst. They will lice. And this is usually what happens when you give someone the wrong blood type. If you give someone the wrong blood type, they're going to see antigens that don't belong to them. They're going to make antibodies, which will cause red blood cells to stick together, and then lice, hemolysis. That's what you see in this picture and figure 19.8. Red blood cells have clumped together thanks to this antibody, and the cells have hemolysized. They've burst open. And when it comes to antibodies, antibodies aren't just attacking any old antigen. So you don't have to worry. Turns out antibodies are very specific. Each antibody attacks a specific antigen. And they tell you in the name. Every antibody has a name. There's the anti-A antibody, anti-B antibody, and the anti-RH. Sometimes called the anti-D as in dog antibody. They all tell you. The anti-A antibodies will attack A antigens. The anti-B antibodies will attack B antigens. And the anti-RH antibodies will attack RH antigens. So in that previous picture I showed earlier, you saw somebody with A antigen. You saw A blood type and you exposed it to anti-A antibodies. And it only attacked those A antigens, causing red blood cells with the A antigens to stick together and, homolo and undergo hemolysis. Mm -hmm. So keep it simple. A antibodies attack A antigens, B antibodies attack B antigens, and RH antibodies attack RH antigens. So how can we tell our blood types? Now that you know really what's going on, it's based off proteins. How do I know? How do I know I'm O positive? How do I know my red blood cells only have the RH antigen on the surface? It is super simple. This is what happens whenever you go to the doctor and they test your blood and tell you your blood type. Or even when you go into one of those blood donation mobiles and they tell you your blood type in about five minutes. It's not super science. You now know what's going to happen. If I expose an antigen to an antibody that usually attacks it, I will see red blood cells clump together. So whenever they tell you your blood type, all they did was take samples of your blood and exposed it to antibodies and, see, and they waited to see if blood cells agglutinated. That's what you're seeing on this picture in figure 1919. For each uh, row, they're testing blood to figure out the blood type of this person in the sample. And all they did, you can see, it's broken up into several rows. Each row is the, is the blood type that they have identified. And each column is broken up. And the left column is showing you the blood type again. 
In the middle column, they're showing you blood samples that have been exposed to anti-A antibodies. And in the far right column, they're showing blood samples that have been exposed to the anti-B antibodies. So let's go through them, row by, uh, row by row. Starting with the blood type labeled A, the first row. So again, they just kept it simple. They took two drops of blood and then they added some antibodies. To one drop in the middle column, they added the anti-A antibodies. And what you're seeing, looks like these little red specks. What you're seeing are red blood cells agglutinating. You're seeing red blood cells stick together. So if I see these red blood stick together, that must mean there were A antigens for these A antibodies to attack. So I know this person at least has A antigens. And over on the, on the far right column, they took that same person's blood and they exposed it to anti-B antibodies. And if you notice, it still looks like a regular drop of blood. Why? Because cells are not agglutinating. Why? Because there are no B antigens for the B antibodies to attack. So from this first row, you could tell from this person's blood's reactions, they only have A antigens, not B. That's why this is an A blood type. Go down to the next row. You see again, they took two samples of blood. In one, they exposed it to anti-A antibodies and you see it again still looks like a drop of blood because there were no A antigens for the anti-A antibodies to attack. But over in the B column, you see agglutination. You see the red specks again. You're seeing cells agglutinate because there were B antigens for the B antibodies to attack. So this person had no A, A, A antigens, but they had B antigens, only B. This is a B blood type. Let's jump down to that last row. I love talking about my favorite person. Oh, there I go again. Remember, I'm an O type. Remember, I'm, to be an O type means you have no A or B antigens. So if you were to expose my, my blood like they did in this last row for the O blood type, Call, uh, row, where they added the anti-A antibodies. It still looks like a drop of blood because there's no agglutination because there's no A antigens here. And the same thing for the anti-B column. They expose that same blood to anti-B antibodies. And again, it still looks like a regular drop of blood because there were no B antigens to cause agglutination with the antibodies. So this is the reactions my blood will have if you exposed it to anti-A and anti-B. You won't see anything happen. Why? Because I don't have any A or B antigens because I'm an O type blood. <clears throat> so this is all they're doing when you go to the doctor and they tell you their blood type. They just took some samples of your blood real quick, exposed it to some antibodies and waited to see if cells clumped together. If they clumped together, it mean you had the antigens that antibody usually attacks and they quickly could tell your blood type. So you can see a lot of medicine is not super science. It's just us kind of taking advantage of what we know in anatomy. So now you know how to type blood, expose it to an antibody that you know the antibody and see if there's any reactions, any agglutination. If you see agglutination, it means it had the antigen that the antibody attacks. If it does not agglutinate, if it does not react, it means they did not have the antigen. So now we could take all that information about blood types now and reapply it to our transfusion scenario. And I told you in the beginning, you gotta make sure that blood types are compatible. You don't want to accidentally kill someone because you've caused agglutination and hemolysis of all the red blood cells because you gave the wrong blood types. So when you do a blood transfusion, you got to make sure you're giving compatible blood types, meaning you got to give blood to someone who does not have antibodies against it. And if you're worried, believe it or not, you can make a mistake. Yeah. Technically, if you think about it, you could actually make one mistake, one time. You could give someone the wrong blood type one time, technically or theoretically. Why? It has to deal with the antibodies. Turns out antibodies A and B are preformed. Okay, antibodies A and B are preformed, meaning you have them before you're even exposed to the antigen. 
right. So, for example, in my body, even though I've never received a blood transfusion, I already have anti-A and anti-B antibodies in my blood. But when it comes to the anti-RH antibody, a person only makes this antibody if they've been exposed to an RH antigen. So if you're a negative blood type, remember negative blood types do not have an RH antigen, they won't necessarily have any antibodies unless they get blood of someone who has the antigen and then they will begin to make the antibody. So technically in these negative type peoples, you can make, theoretically, make the mistake of giving them a positive type blood and they won't react. Why? At least not the first time. Why? Because you do not have preformed anti-RH antibodies. And that's all this slide was really talking about. Yeah. But, but going back to the transfusion, I, gotta, I told you, you got to make sure the blood types are compatible. Right? When blood types are compatible, we say you've matched them. So whenever you get a blood transfusion, they always talk about having the blood matching. You're just making sure you're having blood types that are compatible. Right? Meaning that the person receiving the blood does not have antibodies to the, blood that they're, to the antigens on the blood they're receiving. Because if they do, we already know red blood cells will agglutinate and undergo homolysis. We give a name to this. When you give someone the wrong blood type and trigger agglutination and hemolysis, we call that a transfusion reaction. I want you to know what is a transfusion reaction. Transfusion reaction is when you've destroyed red blood cells because you've given someone the wrong blood type and they've undergone agglutination and hemolysis. And this is deadly, and this happens extremely fast. It can happen within minutes of receiving a blood transfusion. Why? Because you're destroying red blood cells. And this could destroy, technically, all of the red blood cells over a period of time. But that's not really how the person is going to die during a transfusion reaction. When a person is undergoing a transfusion reaction, they die, typically, because of kidney failure. How is that? How, does, how do you have kidney failure just because you got the wrong blood type? Well, because you got the wrong blood type, again, you're going to undergo agglutination and hemolysis, and you're going to have tons of red blood cells you're going to have to get rid of. And one way your body technically likes to get rid of waste is with your urine. Remember, you pee out waste. Well, in this case, you're going to have a ton of waste. There are going to be a lot of red blood cells. Remember, you have a lot of red blood cells in your body. And this is going to overwhelm your kidneys and cause them to fail. And when your kidneys fail, eventually you would fail. You would die. So people from transfusion reactions, if they don't die from a heart attack, they typically die from kidney failure, organ shutdown. So it's very important to make sure blood types match. So you got to know what blood types have what antibodies. And it's super simple. You do not have the antibody if you have the antigen. So for example, there's the A blood type. The A blood type, remember, has the A antigen. And so if you have the A antigen, you will not have the A antibody. Why? Because you don't want to attack yourself. Remember, A antibodies always attack A antigens. So if you are A blood type, you do not have the A antibody because you should not attack yourself, okay? So what antibody will the A have? What is it missing? Well, it's missing the B. So we'll be have B antibodies, but not A. It's the kind of thing you have the opposite antibody to the antigen you have. If you have A antigens, it means you will have the B antibody. Or if you have the B antigen, you will have the A antibody. Why? Because you should not attack yourself. Oh, what about my favorite person again? What about me? What about those O types? Well, you remember, they don't have any A or B antigens, so they will have both the A and B antibodies. So I have both A and B antibodies. So you should never give me anyone with A type blood, B type blood, or AB type blood, because my antibodies will attack, I will have agglutination, hemolysis, my kidneys will fail, and I will die. Okay. <clears throat> uh oh. So that's what it means to make sure blood types match. You don't want antibodies attacking antigens. 
You don't want hemolysis. You don't want kidney failure. You don't want your patient to die. There are some examples to kind of help help you to go through this when they're talking about who you could give blood to and receive blood from. The whole point of doing a transfusion is to safely give them blood without causing agglutination. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, luckily there's ways to kind of cheat. Okay. And it's it's not really cheating. It's just us taking advantage of this anatomy knowledge. We now know the and uh, the blood types and the antigen each blood type has. Okay. So there are some blood types that don't have any antigen, or at least one blood type that doesn't have any antigen. There's a blood type that has no A, no B, or RH antigen. Which one is that? Remember, if it does not have A or B, well, it's an O. And if you do not have RH, that's negative. So I'm talking about the O negative blood types. They have no antigens. And because there are no antigens, well, antibodies can attack. If, if there were A antibodies, well, there are no A antigens. It won't attack. Same thing for the B and same thing for the RH. So technically, you could give an O negative blood type to anybody because it has no antigens for the antibodies to attack. And so because of that, we call the O blood type the universal donor. I want you to know that. The O blood type is the universal donor. It has no antigens, so no antibody could attack it and you will not trigger a transfusion reaction. This is the type of blood ERs love to have on hand. ERs, emergency rooms, love to have O negative type blood, universal donors, because you could give it to anybody in an emergency. When someone comes in and they desperately need blood, sometimes you don't have time to check out their blood type. You need to quickly give them blood. Go and reach for O negative. You will not hurt that person. <clears throat> and by the way, if you're an O negative type and you ever tell a blood bank, they will never leave you alone because they're going to love your blood because they could give it to anybody. Okay. And if there's a universal donor, there must also be a universal recipient. If there's a blood type that could be given to anybody, well, there must be a blood type that could receive blood from anybody. Why? Because this will be a blood type that has no antibodies. Oh, how do you have no antibodies? Well, it's because you have all the antigens. Remember, if you have the antigen, you do not have the antibody. So the blood type that has no antibodies is the blood type that has all the antigens, the A antigen, the B antigen, and the RH. Uh, what blood type is it? Just break it down. Remember, if you have the A and B antigen, you are the AB blood type. And if you have the D or the RH, you're positive. So we're talking about AB positive. AB positive is what we call the universal recipient. You could give this blood type to anybody. Why? Because, or this, sorry, this blood type can receive blood from anybody. Sorry, receive blood from anybody. It's the universal recipient. Why? Because it has no antibodies. Why? Because it has all the known antigens. Remember, you cannot or should not attack yourself. All right. So that's a little bit on blood types. Make sure you know the blood type, what antigens that blood type has, what antibodies that blood type has, who you could give blood to, and who you could receive blood from, and make sure you know what is a transfusion reaction. And a lot of this is all summarized on one table, table 19.4 in your, in your textbook, does all that for you. In this table, it shows you the blood type, it shows you what antigens are on the surface. It shows you what antibodies that blood type has. It shows you who you could give blood to from this type. And it shows you who, what blood types that specific type could receive blood from. Make sure you know this chart. For example, I could, I could give you an example. There are also concept boost slides on your sl PowerPoints if you're reading it at home. But I could give you an example. I could say John is a B negative blood type. If John is B negative, what is John? What antigens are on John's blood? If he's B negative, well, he only has B antigens. We're still sticking with John. I could say John is a B negative blood type. What antibodies does John have? Well, he's B negative. Well, he's not going to have the B antibody because he's not going to attack himself. But he's B negative. 
He has no A antigens and no RH. So you, he will have those antibodies. So John, with his B negative blood, will have anti-A and anti-RH antibodies. So I could ask these questions, or I could work the other way. I could say, you have a patient that has only A and RH antigens on the surface of their blood. What blood type is that if you only have A and RH antigens on the surface of your blood? Well, that's A positive. And then I could ask, who can you give and receive blood from? It's all, if you, if you don't want to memorize it, you can just think about that compatibility. Think about the matching. Okay, remember, if you have the antibody, don't give me a blood that has that antigen. Remember, let me give you my example, me, my favorite person. Remember, I'm O negative. Remember, I only have the A and B antibodies. So if you were to give me a type A blood, I might die because I will have my A antibodies attack it. So don't give me anything with A. Don't give me A positive, A negative, A B positive, or A negative. Anything with A might kill me. Same thing for the B. Remember, I'm O. I have no B antigens, so I have the B antibody. So do not give me an O positive. Do not give me O negative. Do not give me A B positive. Do not give me A B negative. They will kill me. Turns out if I were to get into an accident and I need blood, I could only get blood from two types. I could only get it from O positive and O negative. Okay. And if you're an O negative, oh, you're out of luck for real. Remember, you have no antigens on the surface, so you have all the antibodies. So if you're O negative, you could actually only receive blood from other O negatives because all the other blood types have at least one antigen and that O negatives antibodies will attack. Yeah. So you could either memorize the chart or just break it down based by, off those com compatibilities, that matching. And that's blood. And then to finish off, we talk about one last thing that could go wrong. I want you to know this one last problem. It's a problem you see in mothers and their babies, their fetuses. It's called erythroblastosis fatalis. This is, a, this is almost like a blood transfusion reaction that's occurring in utero, in the womb. This is a problem in mothers who are Rh negative. Yeah. They have negative in, the, in their blood type, meaning they do not have the Rh antigen. Some, the mother doesn't necessarily have to have the exact same blood type as the baby or the fetus she's carrying. So this is really a problem when you have an RH negative mother who's carrying an RH positive fetus. Oh, remember that RH negative mom has no RH antigens, but she has RH antibodies. That RH positive baby has RH antigens. Guess what's going to happen? That mom's antibodies are going to attack that baby's blood cells and cause uh, agglutination and hemolysis. And this will kill the baby. Okay, erythroblastosis fatalis is usually fatal for the infant because the mom's antibodies attack all the baby's cells, red blood cells, and all those cells will undergo agglutination and hemolysis, and the fetus will die. Okay. Why? Because antibodies could cross the placenta. Uh, some blood mixing does occur... Uh, as the baby is growing and also during delivery. And some of this blood, it's minor exchanges of blood. But even though it's minor, it's still going to cause agglutination hemolysis. You will still destroy the baby's cells and possibly kill the baby. But this isn't a problem all the time. Remember, you only make RH antibodies after you, you've been exposed to the antigen. So technically, theoretically... A mom who's Rh negative could have an Rh positive baby once and be okay the first time. Why? Even if their blood mixes together, because this is going to be the first time your the mom's cells are going to see this antigen, and they're going to begin to make the antibodies. So that first baby is going to be okay. But after the first positive or Rh positive baby, if she has a second one, any subsequent baby who's also Rh positive, if their blood happens to mix together, uh-oh, she now has Rh antibodies and they will now attack the baby. Okay. 
so a mom could potentially avoid erythroplastosis fetalis, the first pregnancy. But any pregnancy afterwards where she's carrying an RH positive baby, you will see erythroblastosis fetalis occur and the baby will die. But hopefully, your doctor, again, knows anatomy and there's ways to prevent this. You might know if you've actually um, experienced this with a female, there's a medicine doctors can give to prevent this from happening. It's called Rogam. Rogam. R-H-O-G-A-M. Rogam. Rogam is a medicine that's going to help to prevent erythroblastosis fetalis from occurring. Okay. So if you are ever, uh, if you know as a female that you're RH negative, if you ever get pregnant, make sure your doctor can help to identify the baby's blood type and possibly give you Rogam to prevent erythroblastosis fetalis. If it's anything other than your first pregnancy. So that's it on blood. Now you know pretty much everything that we talk about in blood in this chapter.